<clears throat> How 80% of wholesalers get their first deal, the top three ways how and why and exactly how you can do it to get your first deal and find your first deal in as little as three days. What is up, guys? Zach in here. Rick in here. And in today's video, what we really want to do is break down the top methods on exactly how most wholesalers get the first deal. And through our careful research and looking over everything and really looking at every of these people giving their first wholesaling deal, we have found that 80% of wholesalers get their first deal from just three things, right? Mm -hmm. And I can really put them in this category. And it's going to be a shocker for you to figure it out, but it's actually not that complicated. So that's why in today's video, we're going to share exactly the top three ways and really how you can use the 80% of these ways to get your first wholesaling deal in as little as three days. But before I break it down, y'all know what to do. Make sure y'all hit that like button and subscribe. And we're going to break down everything you need to know about wholesaling real estate. So guys, make sure you smash that like button, click that subscribe <sighs> button, comment below your questions, and we'll share and show you guys exactly how to get it going, how to get your first wholesaling deal in as quick, small amount of time as possible. And hey, most gurus will charge you a thousand bucks for this information, but you already know we got to give it absolutely for free. So we're excited. So uh, let's get it going. You know, I, I think so <clears throat> many wholesalers... Uh, they get so confused, right? That, like, mm -hmm. They're like, what do I do? They got all this information. And I really think if you simplify this business, and that's what we're going to really break down today, right? We're going to kind of show uh, the split of how you should spend your time pulling lists, marketing, all these things, and really show where to go, right? Yeah. So, so I tell you what to do with your time and how to do with your time. You should have all the success possible in wholesaling. Yeah, it's uh, the guy's just saying rocket scientist. So if you follow the path that people have already created and if specifically on the ones of the deals that they found then it seems the reason that you could have the same success by following this so let's break it down guys so without further ado <clears throat> you already know what to do make sure you guys hit that like button subscribe and let's get it going guys Woo! <laughs> Fuck out of bed, bitch, go. Get up, get up, and then they got go. Gotta wake up, gotta wake up, bitch, get up. Get up, get up, get up. Get up. Get up. Ready. We're ready to go. We're ready to break everything down on exactly how 80% of wholesalers get the first deal. But really, let's kind of break down the first thing, right? So there's two ways to get started wholesaling real estate. You're really going to think of it like, how does 80% of people get their first deal? Well, before we break that down, let's kind of break down how to spend the time, right? Because mm -hmm. you might know exactly where to go, but if you don't spend the time correctly, it's not going to do well. So let's break down the first thing. And the first mm -hmm. thing here is how should I spend my time correctly? So how does most wholesalers that are successful spend their time. We have really found what we call a three one one split. Mm -hmm. And that's honestly going to be the best split for most newbies, most beginners in wholesaling real estate, because this split is clearly going to show how you should spend your time correctly and exactly how you should spend your time for the best success possible in wholesaling. And this quick split is pretty simple, right? This is spending three hours for, so for basically every five hours of wholesaling real estate, mm -hmm. we have basically found that you should spend at least three hours marketing, one hour on acquisitions, follow-up appointments, and at least an hour for cash buyers. If you follow the split, you're, you're really going to be able to spend your time effectively and really focus on what's most important, right? And yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's it's just a real simple plan. So if, if you follow it, obviously the marketing is the first one. You got to put a majority of your time in there and don't forget about like working your cash buyers on the backside. So it's... To me, it, it, it's a foolproof plan that works really well. And 
if, if people say, well, what if I have 10 hours? I'm like, just double it. It's like really easy. So it'd yeah. be uh, six, two, two. Yeah. So if you have 10 hours, you're going to put in a wholesaling real estate, put six hours of it into the marketing, two hours of it into cash buyers and two hours in the follow-up and acquisitions part, right? I think it's really important in wholesaling real estate that you should be able to follow the split correctly because it's going to lead to the best success possible in wholesaling real estate. So uh, let's break it down exactly what else we need to know here. So I think the thing you got to understand is how do most wholesalers get their deal? Like what, what's one thing everyone coming into 2023 should really focus on? And honestly, I've, I've always seen this and I've always said this, but niche lists are king. And I could say it once, I could say it a million times, but niche lists are going to be king. And this is because to get results that others don't, you have to do what others won't. And what won't your competition do? Won't What won't most wholesalers do? They won't go after the lists that are difficult. They won't go after the lists that have real motivation because it's a lot of work. And frankly, I think everybody knows this, but it is a lot of work in wholesaling real estate to go out here and pull these niche lists, right? It, yeah. It's very difficult, but because it's difficult and you go through the suffering of getting through that list, when you get the seller, it's actually pretty easy versus an easy list when the suffering is dealing with the competition of people going after that list, right? And I always get people, they come up to me, they complain, they're like, Zach, you know what? I'm so sick of this. I pull a high equity lead and every other wholesaler talks to them and I'm sick of it and I can't do it anymore. This is terrible. What's the secret? I say, go after a niche list. And they go after a niche list and say, Zach, it's so difficult to get the list. Oh, this is terrible. I'm like, but what do you want? You're complaining on the back end for the first one, and now you're complaining on the front end. There's going to be some suffering you got to deal with. I'd rather you deal with the suffering of pulling a niche list versus the suffering of pulling a high equity list and then going through the suffering of being saturated with all the sellers saying no, right? Like, which one do you want to deal with? And one's going to lead you to more money, and one's going to lead you to less money. It's like the suffering of not being healthy, right? It feels good to eat whatever you want and not exercise, but at the back end, it's not going to feel good. And the suffering of eating healthy and maybe some, you know, like portion control or something like that, it's not fun, right? It's not fun yeah. eating donut, not not eating donuts all day, but like, mm. guess what? At the end, it's not going to be as bad. And it's kind of like, that's the way I really look at it. And that's the way I look at work too, right? I'd rather work hard in the beginning so I don't have to financially stress versus you know, <laughs> stressing the beginning of financials and then stressing at the end of it. Right. Um, so maybe you don't want to do the work. It's not stressful in the beginning, but because you didn't do the work, now you're financially stressed at the end. So um, a lot of the stuff we have and a lot of stuff in wholesaling real estate, you'll find a zero sum. And I know a lot of wholesalers don't like talking about that, but wholesaling real estate does come up to be a zero sum game uh, to what is taken. One is given and what is given one is taken. And mm. Uh, what is worked for, one is earned. And if you've earned, you have to work for it. And if you haven't gotten anything, probably didn't work hard enough for it. And you have to equal your results. And we've always said this, but action equals results. To get the result you want, you have to do the action it takes to get that result. So if I want to make 100K, I'm going to have to do the work it takes to make 100K. That is the point. Niche lists are king. And most wholesalers aren't willing to do it, right? Yeah. So guys, keep in mind when you're going to get your list, <clears throat> um, you're going to get resistance. Like the, the better the niche list, the actually the harder it's going to be. And you need to look at it as like, well, that's an invitation because if it's harder up front, that means it's harder for everybody else. So the easiest way to analyze it when you do it is I always teach you is to overcome resistance with persistence. It means just to steadily be nice and just keep killing them with building rapport and keep going back. The average person, if you can overcome at least two objections, you usually get whatever you want. Oh, yeah. But you can't threaten them. You got to be nice about it. So, guys, when you get resistance, just remember to overcome it. It's persistence. And if you keep that simple, like, I don't know, it's kind of like a childhood rhyme, but it works. It works for everything you do in life with that. So when you get resistance, it's really easy to overcome with persistence at least twice. Yeah. Resistance with <clears throat> persistence. That is the key here. So, that's what we're going to break down today. So let's break down what are the niche lists, right? So the niche lists are going to be probates, code violations, arrest records, water shutoffs, fire damage properties. Now there's a lot more to it, right? There's tax liens, there's tax delinquencies. I wouldn't put pre-foreclosures as a niche list per se, but this is kind of like a quick overview of like very difficult list to get for most wholesalers. And the arrest record list is actually pretty simple to get. 
but to cross-reference that data of the owners and people that actually own real estate, that's a lot more difficult to do. Water shutoffs, fire damaged properties. I think we've talked about that before. Not the easiest thing in the world to pull. But when you do this, you are going to get lists where most wholesalers aren't able to do it. And I remember talking to one guy, uh, I think Sunday or Friday. No, Sunday or Thursday. Uh, my live or the last live I was on before. And he was the only person that was pulling, I believe, the water shot off list. And it was amazing, right? Yeah. And he's the only person in the whole county that was able to get it. And we said before, we've had some markets in Florida where we were the only wholesaler pulling the probate list. And now there's other wholesalers pulling it. But like, if you can get through all the difficulty, there's a lot of uh. rewards at the end. There's a lot. And I think so many wholesalers get so confused of it. And I, I just think so, so many people get, they get so stressed out of a saturated list. So many people get so stressed out that, oh my gosh, my, my market's too saturated. I'm like, no, it ain't too saturated. You're just, you have to get to your level of your competition and higher. It's like I always say, Kobe Bryant, LeBron, like, you know, Michael Jordan, they don't care that there's a lot of people wanting to be in the NBA. They don't care. Give them a million NBA players. They're going to whoop their, all their butts, right? Like, you know, uh, Tyson Fury, the boxer, he doesn't care how many people want to fight him or how many boxers there are. He's, he's going to whoop all their butts because he doesn't care about the competition. He rises above it. So when there's competition in my market, I don't <clears throat> fear it, right? I, I don't care. And I think so many wholesalers really, uh, they, they get really scared, confused over competition. It just, it drives me crazy. So, all right, let's go to the next part here. Uh, let's talk about this. You know, let, let's kind of break down the top three things that 80% of wholesalers that get their first deal, they do these three things, right? What are the three things that I'm talking about? What are they? Uh, let's break it down. So I think the first thing we got to talk about are, uh, this is going to be a shocker for most people starting, but this is absolutely true, but drawing for dollars. I think the first thing we can always say is there's three ways where most wholesalers get their first deal. Number one is going to be drawing for dollars. And it's not the most popular way of getting someone's first deal, but you combine it with these three things. It's it's kind of an easy basket to put, but I'm talking about 80% of first deals. And I've talked to a lot of people, hundreds of thousands of wholesalers we've helped. And number one, if I can put one bucket of these people, they're drawing for dollars or they're reverse drawing for dollars, right? They're getting in their car. They're looking for ugly looking properties. And then from there, they're either calling them, texting them, sticky note, whatever they're doing. Some do direct mail, right? But drawing for dollars is so important. And especially in 2023, drawing for dollars is actually going to be even more important than ever because of one really huge important factor that most wholesalers are getting, wholesaling is getting bigger. And I've said this a million times, but the second point here is because wholesaling is getting more saturated, it's going to get harder to find these lists. And everyone's going after the paid lists. Everyone's going after the, so, I mean, your market, a lot of people are going off the government list now, right? So you have to get a list that you have to earn. And that is the most important part. You can't buy a drying for dollars list. You have to earn the drying for dollars list. And it's really a list of all ugly looking houses. And I hate to say this, frankly, but the government list cannot get every single type of distressed property. It, it, it nets a very good amount. And I could probably say 60, 65, 70% of ugly properties can get sifted through because I mean, think about it. The reason why most properties are ugly or distressed is because of financial issues with the seller or the property, which government lists are really good at doing that. But drawing for dollars kind of gets that extra 20, 30% that no one ever does. And it's kind of funny, but it's like, it's just the extra part. And I, I think so many wholesalers neglect it. But when you're really struggling right now, drawing for dollars is cheap, it's effective, and you can really destroy competition with it. And We've been pushing so many people. We had a Drawing for Dollars challenge last month, and it really pushed a lot of people to get their first deal because they started going after properties that they couldn't even think of, know their wholesale in the market was doing, and they stopped complicating it. And that's why I think Drawing for Dollars is so amazing and so important is because you don't complicate things, right? You don't pull lists, cross-reference crazy. You don't do any of this stupid stuff, right? You go in your car, you look for ugly houses. That's it. And I talked... If you can just have conversations with people that, that have ugly houses that you find, you're going to get a deal. You're going to get leads. You're going to get somebody that wants to sell the property, just get rid of it for cash. That is the power of drawing for dollars. And if you use the sticky notes that, we, that you put on the property, it's like doing direct mail. You're spending thousands, probably 
three to four thousand dollars with the direct mail if you go hard in a month for the cost of probably you know two three hundred bucks like you're you're getting a you're getting you're you're getting rid of it by a multiple of 10 of your marketing it, it's insane and this is why drawing for dollars is amazing this is why we're pushing so many people to do it because if you can go from on, on a deal and you're going after four or five other wholesalers calling them trying to get the deal interested their competition to having one or two that's amazing and a lot of their drawing for dollars deals no other wholesalers actually talk to them and what do you think that means there's no competition it makes it so much easier it's Literally like Kobe Bryant playing against college basketball players, not NBA players, because there's no competition. Yeah, it's easy. It's really, if, if you think about the speed of it, if I have a list, <clears throat> a paid list of 10,000, what we call uh, suspects or prospects, maybe it's a high equity list, a vacant list, list whatever. It's somewhat of a guess based on God knows what uh, parameters, as opposed to you going out and personally getting the list. Say you get 500 and I got 10,000. Well, number one, the 10,000, if I mail to them and cold call all 10,000, it's going to cost me a fortune and it's going to take a ton of time. And honestly, I have no idea. As opposed to you're driving for dollars, you can put this together in like a couple hours. Once you skip trace it, you have a much higher probability of getting a deal because number one, you have a very targeted list that you personally put together that nobody else can duplicate. And number two, you see signs of distress on the property, which are most likely going to indicate some sort of motivated seller. And so your screening goes much faster. So it is a much faster direct path. Which would you rather have 500 highly suspect motivated tellers or 10,000? I have no idea. I have to rip through all of them. And God knows how much time it's going to take. Guys, driving for dollars is the most, in my opinion, the most targeted list you can get. And it has this extra push of giving you the confidence. Like I went out and handpicked these. I know they're ugly. I know they don't look good. I got to get in touch with them as opposed to a big giant list. You have to comb through it, pay it and work your way through it. Guys, don't overlook driving for dollars. I know it's not super sexy, but I will tell you this it is the most highly targeted list you can get. And the last part of it, is because it's highly targeted and it's much smaller than these big bulk lists you paid for. Your speed to lead is so much faster. And if you understand that, that's why you always want to do driving for dollars. And here's, the, here's what you have to understand. When you're really doing good in wholesaling, that's when you really want to do driving for dollars. Don't wait till when you're struggling. So when things are good, do it. So many of you people just react like, oh, we're not getting leads or something. Let's go do it now. If you consistently do this type of marketing, even when things are good, it will ensure the next quarter, the future of your deals. Guys, driving for dollars is, it will never leave. It is the most fast track proven way to get a motivated seller. And I, you cannot replace it with any other type of list. Well, I've always said this. I've said this a million times, but like so many wholesalers, they get so stressed out of pulling the perfect list, getting everything ready. I doing all this. Oh, paying all this money for skip tracing, paying all this money for a dialer, getting so stressed out. And I think the big part about it, it's like a mental barrier. A lot of wholesalers think, oh, you know, this is a saturated list. This is terrible. Oh my gosh. Now, like no, no other wholesaler is going after this list most likely or not every single lead. And there's definitely very, very likely if you got at least 500 of these leads, there's going to be a deal in there. No. And that's the best part. And you're dealing with people who have ugly houses, right? You're not dealing with people that have houses. And there's going to be always the tire kickers, things like that. But like, it's amazing. And it's the best part because, guys, as somebody that co call five hours a day, five days a week for a year straight, that has gone through that, I can tell you, it is a lot easier to go listen to some like Travis Scott in a car trying for dollars. Travis and Scott. Travis Scott. You probably don't even know who Travis Scott is. He's amazing. But who is he? He's a rapper. Okay. But he's also like a, it's, it's another story. But like, you can listen to music, right? And you can go in your car and listen to music, find <clears throat> ugly houses, and then you can have your AirPods in and just slap them on the property and keep going. There's no other way where you can get a lot of money while listening to some bomb music, some awesome music, and make money, right? There's not, right? Like, I can't cold call and do that. SMS text blasting, I can't concentrate that well, right? It, 
drives me crazy. And when you reverse drive for dollars, I feel like I'm selling a course on reverse drawing for like I feel like I'm selling a course on this. Somebody offers a like, course. Someone's, out there. I, I there's I've seen you guys some, need a course for uh, river, uh, driving for dollars. I, I could do it in a minute. No, we have it at freeholding.com. Yeah. But I feel like I'm trying to convince you to. I don't know why I'm trying to, but like you put a sticky note on the property, it costs like mm. half a penny, and the leads call you. So like you have leads coming to you. You get to listen to music and have leads come to you. And the best part about this is you can also, when you're drawing for dollars, you can actually find people that are flipping properties. We've actually done this before. We drive for dollars. We find people <clears> flipping <throat> a house. Hey, what's up? Are, are you guys renovating this property? Yeah, yeah, yeah. My boss is uh, flipping it. Oh, that's interesting. Let me give us information. Now I have an ugly house across the street. Cash buyer right there. Yeah. Boom, 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 right? I cannot tell you how many deals we found and how cash buyers we found by doing that. Trying for dollars is amazing. I found, I didn't tell you, there was a couple people I found online now that are posting on Facebook groups <coughs> this new secret in wholesaling real estate called reverse trying for dollars. And that DM me if you're interested and we can kind of hop on a call and I can tell you about it. I've seen three of these already. I cannot tell you how annoying this is. And I can tell you guys, all the information we give at freewholesaling.com because our following is growing. People get this information. They said, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to shift what we call reverse trying for dollars. I'm going to call it a different name and then I'm going to sell a course on it, but I'm going to call it a secret method to have sellers come to you that cost a hundred, 200 bucks at most a month. Yeah. And you can produce all this money. It's a big secret. I'm going to call it the, you know, what? let's call it the Barracuda method. And we're going to, you know, make all this money guys. It, it, it's insane. It's stupid. Like people are literally stealing what we're giving to you. This live right now, people are probably going to take this information straight up and try to sell you a course on it. And y'all are going to pay for it. Okay. Because it's got some sexy name to it. It, it drives me crazy. Um, I hate it, but what am I going to do with it? Right. It, it, it's insane. So, so guys, and keep in mind when you're doing driving for dollars, as opposed to a list. Now, don't get me wrong. If you can use a combo of the both, it's the best way to do it. When you get list, you are targeting for motivated sellers financial issues, you know, back taxes, um, foreclosure, eviction, um, and so on. When you do a driving for dollars, you are targeting what we call a motivated property. So when you have a list, I will tell you this, you can target your list. And when a motivated seller is not motivated to sell and the, the property is not motivated, it's hard to move forward. If you do the driving for dollars method and you find a problematic property, meaning the property is motivated, meaning it needs work. Whenever you have a motivated property, meaning it's in disrepair, it's in bad shape. I keep them on my list no matter what until that property sold because a motivated property is just waiting for a motivated seller. And when the two align, it's like magic. Now, when you target motivated seller list, back taxes, evictions, foreclosures, the problem is sometimes they are not motivated enough to sell it. And especially if the property has issues, then they don't have a reason to sell it. This is why you're driving for dollars leads. They're so much faster because when you've got a property, it's run down and you know it. And they go, no, there's nothing wrong with the property. I'm like, you know, I drove by, you know, it's missing a mailbox. There's a tarp on the roof and it's boarded up. Maybe I missed something. Once you have that stuff, guys, whenever you have a, a, a property that has boarded up windows, a tarp on the roof, you stick to it till you have it under contract. Even when they tell me to take them off my list, I don't take them off my list because I know that property needs to be sold. So what I'm telling you is you can shortcut it by chasing motivated properties because if you can even just get a slightly motivated seller with a highly motivated property, it's a much easier deal as opposed to doing it the other way. I got to go through 10,000 leads, sort through them, and a lot of them take six months to a year to come around. Guys, when you see a rundown property, they're usually within 30 to 90 days of like wrapping that puppy up. That's why driving for dollars is so valuable. It's hard to really explain that in layman's terms. But if you go out and hunt motivated properties, you just have to wait your time to turn into a motivated seller. Exactly. So let's Steve. talk about number two. Okay. So we've talked about driving for dollars. You can do it. Mm. Uh, I, I saw a fun comment. They're going to call it the secret car technique. They're, they're going to call it whatever. Like, Justin, he's just yeah. making a joke, but like these gurus and any word yeah. like secret, I have a secret method. They don't. The secret is code for paid course. By the way, 
mastermind is code for you have to join a group you have to pay for it and do it and we'll never turn you what we'll never tell you what the turnover is and then you have to contribute all your information yeah guys and you want to do a mastermind anything you can do organically that's the real benefit because everybody brings something to the table i've already done that like i i've already told you you know this i get 98 percent of the top wholesalers i have in my contacts right now and they call me they <clears> reach <throat> out to me we talk we call like we get information and I, I don't pay for it. And it's so crazy when gurus try to do that crazy thing. But like, um, it, it's insane. But guys, just letting you know, it drives me crazy. But uh, it, it, I just, drawing for dollars is amazing. You guys need to do it. If not, do whatever you want. But it just, these gurus drive me crazy. They're, mm. they're getting broker by the second and they're getting more desperate. There's a reason why 300 years ago, people were doing the snake oil thing. And it's the same exact thing. It's human nature. Okay, I'm going to change the name of my secret elixir. I'm going to call it snake oil. And it's going to change everything. Because it's a sexy name. And it's going to like change everything. It drives me crazy. But it's human nature for us to get attracted to that type of stuff. And that's why you all buy the stupid courses. Because it's got a cool name to it. Or maybe it's a challenge with an interesting name. And then you all go buy the course. Because you think it's going to change everything. It drives me crazy. I don't get it. Number two is government lists. And not just government lists. What I mean by this is if you have a wholesaling real estate deal and look at 80% of wholesalers, they got it from either drawing for dollars. Number two here is going to be government lists and not just government lists, right? So like, even if you got a deal from somewhere outside of a government list, that deal was on a government list, for example. So if someone got a deal from a band of time, <sighs> they were probably two years behind on the property taxes, which would have been on the tax delinquency list. So Maybe it'll sue a bandit sign, but that was on the tax delinquency list. Or it was a tired landlord that you had to pay a software for, but it was on the evictions list, right? All of these things, guys, I could tell you a million times, they're all going to be on the government list. And I can go forever in government lists. You already know freeholcing.com or free real estate wholesaling course. That is how you actually learn how to pull these lists. But these are going to be, like we said, like the probates, code violation, arrest records, water shutoffs, fire damage properties, evictions, tax delinquencies, tax liens. Uh, you can even go a little further, the IRS debt lien list, the credit card debt lien lists. Uh, these lists really can go on and on and on forever. Um, niche lists, I can also add bail bondsman, but that's not a <clears throat> government list. So that's going to be a little different. But I can tell you guys, the government lists are going to have 80% of these deals. And the other you know, 15% are probably going to be on a drawing for dollars list because it's just ugly, right? And if you mix those two, that's all you're going to need. Uh, but the government lists are out there, right? We've coined the term government list because no other person wanted to do it. They couldn't make money off of you from it. And so we share how to do it for free because a lot of wholesalers, they get deals from government lists, but no guru ever wanted to mention it, right? And uh, it's something we've always been doing and so many people have started doing and it changes lives, right? It just, it drives me crazy that these gurus out here um, don't talk about it. But the government lists are amazing, right? And if you can focus on one government list, I would probably just stick to the probates. Mm -hmm. And here's a big secret too. And this is a, we'll put this on the hush hush. This will be part of the secret car method we won't talk about. Okay. I'm going to use that too. I'm going to use the secret car method. Secret car method. Hopefully a guru didn't copyright that already. But the secret car method is, all right, let's go back to niche list for a second. Okay. We have our probates, code violations, arrest records. So let's do this really quick. Let's go after code violations specifically because it's one of my favorite mixes. And this is kind of how we like shift things and then curl it together. So if I pull code violations in my city, county, whatever, of all open code violations past 30 days, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull that list and let's say it's 123 Main <clears throat> Avenue, 123 Main Street. What we're going to do here is we are going to go to the property and put a sticky note on it. And you can either get like dmzac.com, Google Maps actually has this and Google and then Apple Maps has this where you can make routes. You don't have to go pay for a software to do this, but like there's also softwares that will make a route so it's mo the most efficient possible. Uh, I believe listaria.com has this too. And I need to check on zacdata.com if they have that, but you can make a route of 10 properties and see which is the most effective route, like a UPS driver or like an Amazon FedEx type person. And you go to those houses, you stick sticky notes, and you drive for dollars in between. It's absolutely amazing. Because once there is one deal, there's other deals around it. And that's really good, right? And uh, I think a lot of people need to be going after that, right? And the last part is just cold calling, right? And 80% of wholesalers, 
get their first deal from either of those three things or had either of those things on the list. So drying for dollars, government lists, and cold calling. So 80% of all first deals in wholesaling real estate will come from drying for dollars. Either that'll be on there, government list will be on there, or there will be some sort of cold calling that had to be done. And so the method and the reasoning why we're talking about this and how you're going to use this to get your first deal in three days or less or find it is if 80% of all people have to go through these paths to get their first deal, why are a lot of you guys out here trying to do the 20%? And it drives me crazy, right? So many wholesalers will try to do Facebook SEO ads or something crazy to get their first deal and spend all this money and like, oh, I'm going to go use a paid list and then I'm going to get SMS text blasted or guys, it drives me crazy because if you are doing what, if 80% of people that became successful getting their first deal had to go through these three paths, why are you going to try to do something different than that, right? And it drives me crazy, right? It's, it's, it's just doing the long path and you're going to be set up for not failure, but you're going to be set up for a lot of pain if you're trying to do it the other path because if you're going against where most wholesalers can do it successfully starting out, it, it's not good. And don't do, don't try to get all your success off the 20% unless you know it's going to be amazing. Do what it takes. And if 80% of people are successful getting their first deal from these methods, do them, right? Um, I, I just think a lot of people try to go against the grain. And they think the most popular thing is doing, you know, this crazy method this one person says. And like, I remember one, I should just JV all my deals. There's guys that can JV all their deals, right? Mm -hmm. But it's very difficult to do that. Right? I agree. Like, don't guys just if a pass already laid out for you and it's proven, don't try to reinvent the wheel. Like wholesaling is is not the the is not the business, not the sport to like pave your own way because it's painful and expensive to pave your own way. I've tried paving my way in several different ways. And I always go back to the proven route. So just, you don't need to be a hero. The idea, the hero is to get you to financial freedom is you got to get deals done. So if 80% of the deals are done this way, take the clues and use them. And don't like you, you are not that smart that you're going to find like a separate way. And you think you're going to master Facebook or PPC. It's a whole different world. I don't even do it because <laughs> it, it's, it's a really, really uh, expensive route. And unless you have the staff and everything set up to do that way and you're willing to make a year investment on it, just work with, go with what works. So the idea is to get those first few deals under your belt so you have options like for future marketing. And if you can figure out how to make money on driving for dollars, cold calling and using government lists, then imagine what you can do when you have like paid dollars to assist you in your marketing. You'll do it very well. Whereas a lot of people, when they start out and they hire a guru, the guru goes, "Let's you got to spend three to five grand a month on marketing." You know why they do that? Because it makes it super easy for the guru. The problem is you're you got to probably smoke through your money because you don't know how to talk to those people, and the only thing that's going to get you experience is time. So I rather you have high reputation on people failing in the beginning, because once you get through it, say you get through three thousand phone calls, you get a deal. Those 3,000 are now the blueprint for you going forward and you can be much more precise and you'll have the confidence to close a ton of deals in the future from that. Yeah, exactly. So that's what we got to say about that. Mm -hmm. That's how I think most wholesalers get their first deal. And I mean, that's how they do it. And you should probably do it too, right? So what I want to do is answer some questions and see how we can help you guys become the best wholesalers possible and uh, really see what I can do to help lead you to the best success in wholesaling real estate. But again, before we break it down, make sure y'all go to freewholesaling.com or free real estate wholesaling course, where we'll share with you exactly how to get started in wholesaling real estate and how to be the most successful possible. You don't have to go through it. I'm just letting you know your competition is probably going to go through it. And we're getting tens of thousands of people signing up every single month at freewholesaling.com. So either your competition is going to get the skills and whoop your butt, or either you're going to do it and match them and then rise above it. It's up to you which one you want to do. Um, the word is out. The gurus cannot hide freewholesaling.com from anyone anymore. They used to. They tried. Uh, they tried, but it's not really suppressive. You, you can't really suppress it anymore, right? It, it's a movement. And <clears> gurus <throat> tried really hard at the beginning of the year to stop it, but it can't be stopped. Why so. would anybody want to stop something that's like well, absolutely free and is there to help it's you money. out? It's money. And I heard one the other day. is like, well, you, you really need to have a coach for accountability. Guys, 
if you need a stranger, you have to pay for accountability. Trust me. Once you pay them, there is no more accountability for them. It's just simply straight up instruction. If they have a thousand students, you don't make it. I promise you. It's not that big of a deal to them. It's just the truth. If you can't hold yourself accountable, I promise you a coach won't do it. A mentor won't do it. It's those people that realize that eventually you have to stop telling yourself to lie and you hold yourself accountable. That's when you can make incredible growth in your life. And there is no third person that's going to tell you to be accountable. Someday you're just going to have to accept it and go, you know, it's a lot easier. I can get a lot further if I'm just brutally honest with myself. So yeah. that's what you got to understand. You guys got to understand. Freelancing.com. That's where it's at. That's how you become successful. So let's break it down. Let's get into it. And let's really answer some questions y'all have about wholesaling real estate and exactly how we can help you become the best wholesaler possible in your wholesaling business. So uh, first question we got here, let's look here. So got a lot of great love, got a lot of great support. Um, let's see here. Is this available for playback? Yep. This is right on YouTube. So just go to YouTube. Uh, that's where basically all the information we have is going to be on there. So uh, YouTube's going to be where the replay is. It's going to be the best one for you. So uh, let's see here. Mm -hmm. Let's see. All right. Got some people from Canada. Awesome. Cameron says, how much money do you need to start wholesaling? Um, really, you need at least zero dollars. And I don't think that's the question you should be asking. Right? How much money do I need to start it? It's not really the money. It's the effort, right? And I feel like if you're willing to put in the time, you're fine. All you need is really time in this business. You don't need money. You need time. Now, money makes wholesaling a lot easier. And I can say that a million times and it's absolutely true, but it is, it is true, right? Money makes it easier, but it's just a tool, right? Time is what you really need. And if you are having the willingness, the dedication, the drive, and the why of why you want to become successful, you will. But you could have all the money in the world, but if you don't have the time or you don't want to put the real effort in on actually getting better, you're not going to do well. And sometimes people with money, they think they can just kind of like buy their way in. There's no, there's no way to buy your way in. The only way you could buy your in, if you bought a business in a box, which in wholesaling doesn't really exist. No. Anyone who tells you that they've never been successful selling a wholesaling business. A wholesaling business is really defined by the people that drive it and the assets it's collect. So I've watched thousands, thousands of people try to sell a wholesaling business. It, it's not sellable. You yeah. are the asset to the company. So the, your fruits of your labor, your effort, the action you take, well, you, you'll you the results in assignment contracts, um, rental properties, like whatever you want to do. And there's no way around it. And a lot of times when people pay money is they'll do like a big direct mail campaign and they get nervous when they get a lead and it's a really good lead and they don't know what to do. And so many of them think, well, you know, my mentor will help me just get through it. It's not that easy. So what you lack in money, I tell you, you can just make it up in enthusiasm. If you have the right attitude and you understand you're going to have to put in a couple thousand hours just to get up to speed in wholesaling, then go over to freewholesaling.com. It is the perfect setup for you because while you're learning, you can actually earn and make money without going broke through the land, through the landmine of gurus to say that, you know, I'll show you how to do this. And then after they take your money, they're not there. So I find people that have no money and that can use government lists, cold calling, driving for dollars. If they can get a deal out of that, you just prove the theory where you can make money with no money. Now, imagine if you take some money with that skill set. <clears throat> it's dangerous. A lot of people who pay five, 10 grand for marketing a month with no experience and they pay a guru, they're typically going to go in the hole 30 to $40,000 before they get there. Now, some people can handle that, but I'm telling you, you don't have to do that. Those days are kind of gone and behind us. And I find people that don't have money, they tend to pay attention a lot more. So most of the guru's argument is if you pay me five or 10 grand, I have your attention. Well, dude, money's just money. It's really like, it's kind of play money when it gets down to it. Will you pay attention a little bit more? You will for a time being, but unless if, if you get frustrated and tired, you're going to lose your focus. So if you can learn how to make money without money in wholesaling, those are by far the most powerful people I've ever met in wholesaling. The people who paid to play, they got a guru, they paid five to 10 grand. They're usually out in a year or two because 
they bought themselves like a high paying job. And I don't want that for anybody in here. If you can master wholesaling and do it on an extremely limited budget, sky's your limit, man. You can do whatever you want because this bleeds over into all other forms of real estate investing. And remember, wholesaling is the fundamentals of how to get started on real estate investing. And once you master this part, it's great. The people who try to skip wholesaling will always come back to wholesalers to get their help, to get the most deeply discounted deals. That's why you want to be a wholesaler first, hands down. Yeah, that's it. Uh, next question <clears throat> says, can you start accepting more people to Facebook group? Um, I, I'm, I only accept people once and pretty much everyone's accepted in the group. But once you start trying to sell something or you try to take something from people, it, you're, you're blocked. And that, unfortunately, I get a lot of people upset with me. You know, I, I've had one person try to promote a guru and I just, just took him out. Like, I, I'm like, I'm not dealing with this. And it's like, a, if you yeah. spam like 10 people of a guru trying to sell you, I had one lady today and hopefully she's watching. She literally commented on one of the posts I had on the Facebook group said, I made a million dollars this year in wholesaling. Th th that's what they said. They just commented, no proof. That's amazing. And I'll show you a secret marketing method. Um, just DM me and we can hop on a support call. I'm like, block. Posted it 30 times. Copy and pasted it. Spammed it in the entire group, acting like I ain't going to see it. The coolest part is we have special, special HTML on the Facebook group where once you say any words, like any specific words, so if you say call, uh, I, I think DM, a support, a strategy session, any, any like key, every type of guru keyword you ever say, I can tell you, it gets popped off and I look at it, instant ban. So the only people that ever complain about not being able to get back in the group are people that try to take money from people. And I get asked like, Zach, why didn't my post get approved? The only people I've always found that complain that their post doesn't get approved is because that post was trying to take and not give. I always find it. Why are you trying to make that post? Oh, I was, I was trying to uh, get some JV deals. I'm like, yeah. without providing anything, like yeah. show some proof you're wholesaling, maybe help some people out. That's how you get JV deals. Where are my cash buyers at? Like, I'm like, There's what no value does that yeah. give to the community? And what every, value? Yeah, if everybody just keeps posting that, the, the, the group's useless. Have you ever been to a wholesaling group and the first hundred, the, there's a hundred posts an hour and all of them are, where are my cash buyers at? Fiverr skip tracing, two cents. Like that, that, we are the only wholesaling group that doesn't have that stupid stuff. And because if you can give or ask legitimate questions that make everybody better wholesalers, you'll be accepted in the group. If you don't, you're going to get kicked out. Not kicked out, but like you ain't going to be on there. And it's so funny. And my favorite is when people say that, um, I love it when people give bad information, right? Um, but yeah. All right. Let's go here. Let's um, read the rules, guys. Let's read the rules. You know, I, and one thing I can also say in wholesaling <clears throat> real estate is oh, ha not half of it, but a good amount of it's a mindset. So let's use and Vazy edits. I know a wholesaler in California right now that is making 40 K a month in Mobile, Alabama, virtually wholesaling. It's a great market for them. Invazi Edits lives in Mobile, but they think that it's not looking good. So here's the problem. You have two people, one person virtually destroying it in Mobile, Alabama, knowing it's a great market. And one person saying, I, I, let me tell you right there. If you can't wholesale in Mobile, Alabama, there's no other market that's going to be easier for you. All right. Like it just, wholesaling is probably not your thing. If you are doing what we say in, the, in Mobile, Alabama, you ain't going to do well. I help a lot of people all throughout Alabama. They're all crushing it. They're all doing very well. It's because a great state for it. It's a great state for it. ARVs are cheap and populations are great. And there's a lot of buyers. But when you were saying it's not looking good, first of all, saying that comment, just it's just, it's very negative energy, number one. But this is the, this is the funniest part. It's just like, if, you're, can, if you can't make an easier market work, complaining about it's not going to do anything. And you saying that this market, this is just a mindset shift I have for everybody. You say, my market just doesn't work. You got to give me a reason. If you have pulled a thousand drawing for dollars leads in Mobile, Alabama, got no deal, then you can start complaining. But unfortunately, most people that complain don't do that. And I have not found one person who legitimately put their all in for an entire year of wholesaling, like they're all and not gotten a deal. Um, it's a winner need. 
but your bad market is another person's 40k a month market. So it's all a mindset thing. And I think uh-huh. a lot of wholesalers get really confused. They get really upset that you know, oh, my market's terrible. Your market's terrible because you said it's terrible. Yeah, come, come to Florida or California. I'll, I'll show you a completely my different- My market's great. To but, another person, my market's the worst one in the world. Yeah, but like we know it. So as long as people are selling properties and there's opportunity, it, you could be at whatever price point you want. People make it work in California, New York, um, obviously Florida. Phoenix is having issues. So everybody thinks their own market is like a major issue. <clears throat> Sometimes you need to just go look at others and go, you know what? Mine's not so bad. That's pretty good. Here's the one thing I can tell you in those uh, <clears throat> edits. It, in Verza edits, don't blame the market, blame the marketing. And I've always told everyone to say that. And you really got to do that. Okay. So don't blame the market, blame the marketing. My market sucks. No, say my marketing sucks. That's a better one to say. All right. Just say my marketing sucks, not my market. All right. Just put the ING. My effort sucks. No, just add the ING when you're blaming your market and we'll be good to go. Okay. And Hey, there's a lot more people that have worse markets than you. I promise you. Mobile, Alabama, you're, you're all fine. All right. Like I just, I think it's hilarious uh, when I get that. But yeah. All right. So uh, let's do some one-on-one calls. Remember, if you want to hop on the one-on-ones, just make sure you go to uh, Wholesaling Houses for Real, our free real estate wholesaling mastermind, where we can hop on, let you mm-hmm. guys uh, hop on and do our one-on-ones. So let's go here. Let's go to Wholesaling Houses for Real. And you guys, if you're in a bad market... I'll tell you, like the problem is when I see a lot of virtual wholesalers doing well in a market, I know it's not the market. Okay. Now, if y'all are coming to complaining, you live in LA or San Fran, we can talk about a different story. But so all I got to do is go here. Actually go back. Here is wholesaling houses for real, our Facebook group featured pinned two hours ago, right here. All I got to just click the streamer link where it says join here. Then boom, you'll be put backstage to talk to us absolutely for free one-on-one. So uh, first one we got here is Jonas. What is up? Yeah, what's up? How are you? How are you, man? How can yeah, you I'm good. Uh, yeah, uh, I got two potential deals. Uh, but uh, the thing is, uh, I don't know. Uh, they are both pretty low ARV, like 50, uh, 60, 50K. Uh, and they need repairs. Uh, 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 we agreed on 10,000 for each of them. But, you know, there isn't uh, a lot of room for repair costs, mm. uh, you know, at that low ARV. Like, uh, you know, how do you, you know, those kind of properties, uh, like, what, what do you think? Okay. Well, I mean, it really depends because I think when you're overcomplicating things, right? Like, I think when you're really overcomplicating things in wholesaling real estate, um, that's when the big issues happen. So if we're thinking about what the ARV and the repairs are going to be on it, I always say just like in one sentence, lock it up for the lowest you can and see where cash buyer is going to be at. Mm. And unfortunately, you don't know how much the deal is going to sell for starting out. We don't, but a cash buyer does. And so I, I think that's really what we should be focusing on. Mm. Because unfortunately for a lot of a lot of people out here, it's kind of hard in some of these weird low, low ARV markets because every street, every like pretty much every street or every neighborhood or like block is so much different than the other. And one might a cash buyer want to deal with and one other one might not. So unfortunately you really got to lock it up for the lowest you can and see what you can do. Yeah. Yeah. And they, they also got quite title. Um, but, but, but that the cash buyer deals with that, right? It should be fun. Wait, is it going to be quiet titled to the cash buyer? Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, they bought it from a tax sale. They said so. They, they said that there's paperwork that needs to be done on the properties. Uh, you know, the deed is in their name. Uh, but yeah, the legal term was quiet title. They, they told me. Uh, it's gonna be for Georgia, right? Yeah. Let's see if quiet title is a little different for the tax sales in Georgia. Um. Well, wait. Georgia has a weird law in it. Mm. Let's figure this out. So, I mean, it is a... Hmm. 
I find the quiet title laws uh, provides two forms. Either you have a conventional or statute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, I mean, if you're having the attorney doing it, I think it should be fine. As long as you, you have an attorney clearly doing it the right way and you can get paid off of it, you're going to be fine. I'm just worried you're not going to get paid, but I, I think you should be fine there. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, guys. All right. You, Let me know if you got any other help. Yeah. yeah. Any help. All right. Appreciate it. All right. Oh, next here we got Almond. Hey, guys. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. What is up? Hey, man. Uh, how are you guys? Good. How are you? Good, man. Uh, I just uh, stumbled upon your uh, course uh, not too long ago. And awesome. I've been, yeah, I've been uh, kind of been binge watching your videos lately because it's winter break for us uh, from school. Awesome, man. What's yeah, up? So, How can I help you out? Uh, yeah, so I wanted to know. So I live in uh, Tacoma, Washington. Uh, would okay. you guys would you guys recommend uh, me doing uh, deals locally here? I I I'm I'm still pretty new to it, so it, I'm still trying to get my first deal. Okay, yeah, I mean, try it. If you're locally, just try it. Would you Why Would not? you say it's a, t Tacoma? Would you say Tacoma, Washington, is a good market? No, but I'd still try because you live there. Okay. And then uh uh would you say that uh so putting a sticky note a uh, sticky note would be on both uh driving for dollars and the government lists that I pull? That'd be a great one. I see. And then would you say uh that uh so let's say if I if I get a paid list would it be similar to a government list? Are they going to be they're going to be different, dude. Right? So what do you mean? Of course, they're going to be different because the tired land list is different than the evictions list. I see. <clears throat> Most of your paid list is yeah. use filters within the data aggregators um, to build your ideal profile. Uh, you know, kind of like your avatar for the type of seller you're looking for. A government list is means there's an action that was uh, basically directed by the court. And whenever you have a court action, it's forced. It's not an option. If you don't resolve it, there will be a consequence. So for that reason, there's going to be a little bit higher motivation, but you got to go through the government to get the list. A paid list is kind of like a uh, algorithm that um, any type of search engine is going to use. So right. like, for instance, if, if you're searching for a, a gift item for someone and you're looking for a bookcase that's white, that's four by four with six shelves, that's what you're doing on a paid list. You're sorting the information based on what you want mm -hmm. and it's going to repopulate and give you based on the area that you pick and you can cut and choose all you want. A government list, if, if there is 100 people on the probate list, you get there's 100 people on there. How you get that information is a whole nother story. But remember, somebody passed away. The court is looking to appoint the PR person, the power to enter in a contract to get that property sold. So- um, the paid lists are convenient, but the government list are usually going to have more urgency. A lot of people mixed up. They think the paid list is better because you paid for it. Right. That ain't, that ain't true. That's not true. The real question is, there's going to be overlap on the two lists. Absolutely. There's no way to perfectly do it. But if I had to choose between the two, I would hands down take a government list because to me, there's going to be more urgency for a motivated seller because if they don't do something, the court's going to enter into some sort of agreement that's going to hurt their position on the property. Right. Okay. So, yeah, that makes sense. And then I watched in one mm -hmm. of your videos recently that the market is changing. So you mentioned that it's, it's really important that we should get a buyer, uh, us, uh, a buyer Intel. So uh, would you recommend uh, contacting buyers first and kind of getting what kind of houses they're looking for and then going for driving for dollars and pulling sure. the lists? Sure. So that I don't I don't waste time during my uh, inspection period. Let's say if I were to get sure. a contract, do it. Okay. Cool. Yeah, that those were kind of my main questions, and so and then for government list, would you would you recommend uh, attacking a probates first? Uh, if you, I'm if never going to say no to attacking the probates. Okay. Okay. All right, man. Uh, yeah, those are my questions. So um, I, I feel I, I feel like I have more of a game plan now. So I think I'm gonna I'm gonna go attack it. All right, go after it, man.
Yeah, cool. Thank you, guys. All right. I appreciate okay. all the help. Yeah. Well. yeah. All right. Next here we got Migs. Yo, Migs. He was on yesterday. I'll come back. All right, I'll see him later. Benji. He's hey, muted. Can you hear me? Yeah, what's up? What's going on? Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, I just had uh, one question, but I just want to start off by saying thank you guys so much. I just finally closed that deal I've been working on for five, six months. The probate. <laughs> yeah, dude. The probate foreclosure, uh, that took forever. Um, oh, but I just man. can't thank you guys enough because my whole mindset and perspective has changed for what I thought was possible for myself. And for those of you that are watching the live and who will, will watch the recording later, just do what Rick and Zach tell you to do eventually you will win. You'll have some setbacks here and there, and that's what they're here for to answer your questions, but it's inevitable. You will win. You just have to put in the work. But anyway, the proof is in the pudding. So I already cashed it in Woo! right there. $50,000. Wow. Gosh, that's a lot of money. Uh, Woo! So that was, dude, that was my very first deal. And there was so many twists and turns and it was, it was difficult to navigate, but I honestly, I learned so much from it and I have the confidence now going after right. other stuff. So just to let you know all deals. So like they, they, everybody thinks it's like a straight line. And once you it's understand there's, there's valleys and there's peaks and our whole thing is let's throw 10 deals on the board and let's see how many we can get across the finish line. Very rarely do I ever get a hundred percent. Like, so people shooting for a hundred percent, it only means you got one deal and that's fine because you learn. And the idea is you just keep solving problems and keep going forward. But that one deal, even though it cost you five months going forward, it's giving you the strength and the confidence to get through deals going forward. It's a $10,000 deal for five months straight though. Yeah. And you do it. <laughs> so now you try to get three to five on the board and get more than half of those at the finish line. And it just adds up. And before you know it, you've seen every situation when it pops up, like, Okay, I go to this lawyer. He knows what to do. Guys, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not an accountant. I'm not a title person. I just know who to give it to when the problem pops up. And then I just keep headhunting motivated tellers. So the people that want to solve every problem themselves, you'll never get anywhere in this business. So it's mm -hmm. like, hey, oh, there's a, there's a problem with the title of the probate. Oh, hey, where's the title person? Where's the lawyer? And I just keep going. And it's like, it's frustrating, man. But I've been doing this 20 years. If you don't have problems on your plate about closings, you're not doing wholesaling. All we do is solve problems. And you just get very proficient in doing it after a while. I'm like, okay, what well, takes me five months, now I can get it done in three months. And then you'll get some that just go like really simple. And when they do, it's a gift. I tell them all the time. I go, that's a gift. Let's throw it under the tree. Let's go to the next one. And these other ones like you have, their fights. I've had deals where I've fought over four years. Why? Because I'm already in the game. And honestly... If I told you you could plant a dollar today and at the end of the year you can get 10 grand, would you plant that dollar? The answer is overwhelmingly yes. So just keep going. Congratulations. And um, it's, you know now it's not a coincidence you did this. And now you just keep setting it up. And now you've seen, you've seen a lot with this stuff. You've seen what lawyers do. Um, you see what the motivated yeah. sellers do. So it's fun, man. Like I, I, look at the, I look at wholesaling as kind of like of a sport. And if you look at it like that, right. it's fun. Money is just money. It's just a fun way to keep the score. All right. So, and I think that the most the most that I got out of it was just helping the sellers because they were just in such a bad situation. And it just they were makes lost, me feel, right? Yeah. It and it just makes me feel good that I was able to solve it for them. You know what I mean? Because they were gonna lose the house and get nothing yeah. for it. You know what I mean? So and a, and just, a realtor couldn't probably help them with their problem, right? No, I mean, this house was yeah. in very bad shape. It needed excess over 50 grand worth of work. And so, so when I give you guys the comment where I say, you know, sometimes you need to help the seller get out of their own way. This is probably the prime example because they don't know how to do it. Mm -hmm. You don't quite know how to do it, but you have enough resource to go, okay, I talked to this person. I'm just going to solve this problem. I have a dilapidated house. They want to get rid of it. We have a foreclosure. So I'm going to put a title company a lawyer, and then I'm going to talk to Rick and Zach and I'm just going to find a way to get through it. And honestly, it's that will and the grit that makes the difference on wholesalers succeeding because usually the first one, it just seems like Mount Everest to go over it.
And when you get over it, you're yeah. like, oh, crap, man, if I can get over that, I can get through anything. And yeah, congrats, dude. You know, 50 grand goes like a long way. <laughs> and sometimes you hit home runs. And sometimes it's okay to take a single or a double. Some of you guys taking three and five thousand dollar deals. That's there's no shame in that. I don't know who said you have to make ten grand on every deal. I didn't make ten grand on every deal when I started. Shoot, but, if I made a grand or two every now and then, I was like, man, I was like, look, look what I just did. Well, Benji, uh, you know what? I always say it. I'm like, all right, if one person can listen to what I say, they can make it run, right? And at least you listen to what I had to say, right? I'm like, okay, yeah. I live in Florida. Zach is in Florida. Rick and Zach make a lot of money on probates in Florida. Maybe I should try doing that. And now you have a $50,000 check in your hand because you listen to what we said, right? It just, yeah. How many one-on-one -on -one calls do you think we did to get this deal closed? It was about three to four. It was about three to four, right? Like it yes. was like it, it, it was a lot of handholding, but like the thing is you had like a, you had a probate expert for free hopping on helping out every which way of the way. And I, I bet that helped you out a lot with the confidence yes. getting through that. And yeah, for sure. I'm telling you that like, if anybody has a problem, we're here to help. And those three to four calls, really it's, it's amazing. Right. And kind of like what you said before, like, right. You look, you work out, right. You know what it takes to get like, you know, strong for everybody watching this. It's like working out. If you eat 150 grams of protein a day and you work out five <clears throat> hours a week of like just standard exercises, it's almost impossible not to get stronger, right? Like, if, like you can complain all day, Except but like holiday cookies. No, you're still get stronger <laughs> if you if you do good. what you have to do. My and favorite. if you pull the probates every day with the scripts we say, <clears throat> every single month, you'll get a deal. So, Benji, do you have to take a high-priced wholesaling course to make fifty grand? Yes or no? Absolutely not. So, all these gurus tell you if you don't have skin in the game, you're not going to figure it out. Guys, you guys are paying them five, ten grand to make like little five, ten thousand dollar checks. Mm. Or if I've always told you, just jump straight to the probates. There's, they're far and few between. If you just do two probates a year, which is easy, you can make, in my opinion, fifty to seventy five thousand dollars in this business. So don't stop doing probates. They're slow. You could do them in your sleep. You could have three other jobs and do probates. I swear to you, it's not that hard. And then when you get them, you bring other people to solve them. So if you can make 50 to 75 K just doing that, imagine if you applied yourself like full-time doing it, guys, it's like endless. I get so tired of the argument. I don't have skin in the game. No, listen, I just want to help as many people as I humanly possibly can, because here's the secret. If you paid a guru that had no ex little to no experience in probate, they probably wouldn't have got you to the finish line. It's just the truth. That's yeah. why there's a 95% failure ratio. My teaching, Zach's teaching is like just grit and get through it. So we didn't give you like super precise instructions on the probate. Like, listen, right. just try this, try that. Reach out to your title company if you got a probate lawyer and just keep trying to solve the problem and keep your seller engaged. Did and you just, have to pay a probate lawyer? Did you have to like pay all this money out? No, it's no. It's it seems complicated when you're first starting, <sighs> but like going through the process, you're like, well, it's not that complicated. Like it just Right, you just get through, it and you got paid in proportion to the problem you solved. You feel good because you solved a big problem, and because it was a big problem, you got paid in proportion to that problem. Right, and it's amazing, well, man. Most people starting out, they're like, "Well, you know, this is too complicated. I need to just go find okay. a regular deal, <clears throat> and make it fast." A lot of the the guru mentorship is to get you a deal super fast and get you off the radar. Wholesaling doesn't work that way. Some of you guys are going to take a year to get a deal done. It's just, that's the way you work. I can't change that. If the faster you fail, the quicker you're going to make money in wholesaling. Nothing's ever going to be perfect. You have just got to start saying yes to people and start committing to the process and start engaging these uncomfortable conversations and just get through them. Probate, I found it by accident and I'm glad I've spread the message. So you're doing awesome, man. What can we help you out with? Because now you're on a whole different level and you watch what's going to happen in 2023. Yeah. Um, so I got another deal locked up in West Melbourne. It's a divorce situation. So I just wanted your guys' opinion from your own experience. When someone needs to stay in the property after close, what do you do? Or how would you write up the terms on that based off of your experience? It's pretty easy. Uh, we do a, we, we just hold back money. It's just a, you're going to do yeah. a post lease. How long do they want to stay in it for? 
Uh, the wife needs a week. So oh, that's easy, man. Yeah. So, so this, I just, dude, go ahead. You just do this at the closing. You do a post occupancy agreement from the title company. And basically what you do is if they're getting a hundred grand, just say, Hey, we're going to both 40 K 40 K 80 K. And then y'all, y'all both are going to actually mm -hmm. no. give the guy 50 and give the wife 40. And she gets the 10 when she moves out in a week. If she doesn't move out in a month, she doesn't keep the money and the proceeds go to the buyer. And, and if they hesitate to sign that, it means she ain't staying there. She's week. staying there for free too. It's like, yeah. And she has 10,000 reasons to get out of the house. Yeah. And you still get paid at, t at closing. And you're, and you're, yeah. And your title company will put that together. They're kind of used to it. So just make sure whatever you verbally agree, you put it in writing and yeah. Between okay. you and me, here's what I do though. You know, Mr. Seller, cause you have to stay in there some extra time. We're going to have to probably knock off the price a couple grand, but that's just cause you know, there's some risks involved in that, but you know, because we can do that. Or if you want to like make it at the end, she's like hesitating at 120 and she's at 130. You know what? At 120, mm. you can stand there for, for at least a month. We'll, we'll do it. Yeah. You know, I, you know, my partner's going to kill me on this, but we'll do it. You can now offer that because you, now, yeah. you know, it's actually not that complicated. And so, make sure you, you have permission to market the property and do the stuff you want while you're waiting for her to get out of there. If that's yeah. your plan. Right. So yeah, because I, I gave him a call yesterday because he didn't tell me that when we signed that she would need an extra week. And then he called me again saying that she will. <clears throat> so, But we're going to try to get her lined up for an apartment. That way she can be out the day of close. And then if she can't do that, then I got to work something out with them with a the post-occupancy agreement. Yeah, so, so just be careful with you trying to provide housing. Number one, it's tricky in Florida. It ain't, it ain't easy. Yeah. Well, I'm leaving that up to them. So I yeah, yeah. Because the minute you do it, if you fail, you can screw up your entire deal. Always try to focus on the real estate and keep in mind, dude. I I'm terrible at like these divorce things because, um, are there any kids involved? There's three kids. So yeah, he's done know. with the house. As soon as he gets the money, yeah. he's out. The wow, the wife and the kids have to find a place. So remember, you know, most people get divorced because of poor communication. And just so just understanding you're probably us men are terrible. You're probably only going to get half the picture. Yeah. So it's like when you start getting yelled at by her, he didn't tell you this and that don't have her associate your alliance with him. When right. she's in there, you have to start leaning towards winning her over. Cause you're going to need her cooperation. Number two is like, what's your exit plan when you, um, are you going to sell the property with her in it? Or like, what's the plan? Uh, that's what I think I'm going to have to do. If they can't get her out the day of close, then yeah, it's going to have to be that situation where she's in it after it's sold. Listen, I got to tell you, most cash buyers, they have somebody out in a week's like an easy deal for them. When you tell them like a month, two or three months, that's when they're like, dude, call me. Yeah, that's way too much. And so, and just make sure you have the ability to do what you need to do within like that first week to get it done. But guys, you can sell. It's common to sell properties with tenants in it when you have the owners it's a little bit like dice of your situation. Just make sure if the agreement is a week, it's going to be done in a week or you got like, if not, I got to keep the minimum you keep in there is usually five to 10 grand for like a post-op deal. Cause it's painful because if you have to evict her and stuff, by the way, to evict the, the current owner of the property is much more complicated than a regular eviction. It could take you three months to get her out of there. That's why I always say 10 grand because by the time you pay the lawyer fees and stuff. Yeah. And what if the property drops even more in value? So, um, yeah, just That's pay attention to it. Divorce is the challenging one because you, you get one highly cooperative party and then you get one that's like, I'll deal with you, but I'm not crazy about you. Yeah. So, well, when I was there, I think they were both pretty much on board. So I'm kind of thankful. They seemed on par cause they both wanted to get rid of the house. So <clears throat> But with the 10 to 15 holdback, would you recommend like $100 per day per diem coming out of that withholding until they're out? No, or? no. And it's real simple. You don't cooperate. You sacrifice the money. Yeah. Okay. Now, listen, yeah. you can always change it. But if the pain's up front is built in and they sign it, it shows their intention. Yeah. So you always want to look at people's right. intention when money's on the line because it'll be snuffed out instantly. It doesn't right. mean like if she stayed... We have people all the time say two or three days over the deadline. We're just like, move, <laughs> get your, you know, get your butt out of there. Like that was the plan. Otherwise I got to move on the plan B 
And if I got to hire a lawyer and stuff, I'm just going to give him the 10 grand. So I always tell him, do you want the 10 grand or you want me to, should I just give it to the lawyer? Right. If they wait a couple days, just give them their money and move on with your life. And then if there's damage to the property, then you can take it off from there. But if you ride it to where it's all or nothing, it'll snuff out their intent up front. If you start prorating it, someone might start doing math in their head. And they're like, you know what? This isn't a bad deal because a hotel room is going to cost them two, two fifty a night. Right. That's they go, true. well, Benji's giving me a hundred dollars a night. It's not, but it's not a bad deal. So <laughs> yeah. no taxes, stuff like that. So don't get in the housing. Right. Yeah. And then you can give back if there are two or three days over, if you just want to give back the whole 10 grand, which is probably the right way to do it. But the problem is the two to three days turn to two and three weeks. That's when you got to go. Okay. That's yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. All right. Awesome, guys. Thank you so much. Okay, I appreciate awesome. everything. Appreciate Take it. Care. Let me know if you need help with anything else. Appreciate it, man. Take care. Right. Boom. Awesome. Love seeing that. That's 50000 stinking dollars. Yeah, no man. guru involved. None of that stuff. Just pure value uh, been given and helping them out, right? Just yeah. flex another guru. It's another day, another flex. Um, Steve, what is up? What's up? What's up, guys? I just wanted to jump on here. I know you guys see I have a lot of fun in the uh, the live chats, but I want to just tell you guys I appreciate the content. And uh, Rick, your wisdom is great as a parent and as a uh, wholesaler, so I appreciate that. Zach, doing awesome too, of course. Appreciate and, um, it. Thank you. I had a, um, a quick question, though. I have uh, an owner of a multifamily. I've been going back and forth with the the gentleman for months now. He's a seasoned investor and, you know, he originally told me he wanted a million. I got a cash buyer for 1.1, 1.2. Then he switched it to 1.5. Uh. And uh, it's kind of going back and forth. I have him down probably to 1.3 right now, but I didn't know if it's better where he's scared of the original um, NAR contract that I was using a few months back when I was associated with a realtor. Um, if I'm better off using an option or your great contract, which I also submitted to my attorney and they gave it a, uh, a green light on that. But what do you think is better? And when, what's the difference? So you said it's a multifamily. How, how many, how many units is it? It's a five plus. It's just outside of Boston. Um, you can okay. actually see Boston from it. I know, you know, Boston, you guys are like the uh, multifamily capital of uh, the United States. Yeah. We um, stack them up pretty good over here. So you're saying you've already previously wrote him a contract under like a, the, the real I didn't, umbrella? I didn't write him a contract. I, I presented a contract when I was a uh, real estate agent, which he did not want to sign. He doesn't really um, like realtors. Um, <laughs> go figure. Okay. But um, now I think he, I'm trying to get him to, I'm using the word agreement. I said, if you could just sign an agreement with me then I can get going on it and put something together. But other than that, I told him he should probably see a real estate agent and put it on the MLS, which of course he's against. Yeah. Well, I mean, you, you know, the seller best. So, I mean, you, you have some weapons at your disposal. Um, the investor contract we offer is just, it's clear and to the point and people like this, they just appreciate it because they don't have to like take it to an attorney or a real estate agent to like yeah. see how you're going to screw them. Go listen, here's the price. Here's the terms. Here's the dates. Which one do you want? As far as doing the option agreement, that's up to you. Some people get scared and confused by it. Um, you got to get them committed to a price so you can figure out what you can get a cash buyer from it. Because it sounds like he's kind of been all over the board from anywhere from you know a million up to one point five. Correct? Yeah, yeah, correct. I'm just trying to write to nail him down to a price. You know what's what's the the best that he can do. And if I'm over, you know, I can always go back and renegotiate. But I think an option is less threatening to this gentleman. But <clears throat> yeah, it's uh, up to you. Like some people get scared about options, <clears throat> but be careful. He might want like a big option payment up front. And really, you're, you're looking yeah. to get him to commit to a price while you have time to go out and find a cash buyer and do some basic inspections. You're going to have to ultimately determine which you think is going to be the best way to do it. The problem with an option is it usually takes some sort of substantial payment up front. Now, you can have inspection periods and options, but they're not, they're kind of frowned upon. So most options are at least $1,000 or more. 
So are you willing to risk a thousand dollars to obligate him for like one year at a price? Um, most people like freak out advanced investors. They get scared of options because they, they feel like it's your option, not their option. And why should I be obligated to it? Right. Keep in mind a basic investor contract is just really in theory is a temporary option, which I'm what, which you're using a much smaller number. So like if you came to me and go, listen, Rick, I, I want to give you a thousand dollar option on your uh, your 12 plex. I'll take it if you put the right price on it, because I don't think you're going to be able to perform. So you're going to have right. to understand what his risk tolerance is, because the more advanced they are, the more they understand these strategies. So it's a, it's a five plex. So I'm sure you've ran your numbers on it. You just got to get them committed to a number. How you do that? is completely up to your op. The only downside of the option is they usually want the money like right away and they usually don't take a hundred bucks. So that's the only thing I'm telling you against that strategy that might work against you. Perfect. Appreciate so, that. And again, appreciate the content. I hope you guys have a great Christmas. Yeah. If you're ever up here in the Boston area or Cape Cod, give me a shout out. And uh, hopefully I'd love to uh, JV on some deals. I'm all the way from Boston to Cape Cod pretty much every day in all places in between. Uh, I don't want to be too specific because I hear a few guys on here uh, creeping in in this area, but uh, appreciate it. I mean, the seller went up 50% in their price. That's insane. Yeah, that, that's a lot I of money. usually have never seen I, I don't see anything that crazy. <clears throat> yeah, I've, I've talked to a couple people, and once they see they, there's some interest, they start you know doing their negotiating thing. But uh, it made me kind of look like a not too too great with the, the cash buyer when I switched it up. You know, like I said, the guy was all over the place. But now with your right. uh, with your contract, I'm trying to get it get it locked up like that, and then I'll just go from there. All right. Yeah, I, that's probably the way I do it. I just <clears throat> see sellers get painful. Yeah. <laughs> all right, Steve. Let me know if you got any other questions. I'd uh, love to help you out with anything else. That's it for now. Thanks a lot, guys. All right, appreciate, yeah, appreciate it. it. Stay warm. Bye -bye. <clears throat> gotta be, it's gotta be cold up there right oh yeah <laughs> all right next here we got jared how's it going i'm good how are you hey, amen doing all right finally got you on here zach too oh yeah <laughs> i talked to rick last time i yeah. think it was saturday um, awesome, but I, I just kind of want to say thank you for all you guys do um you guys have helped me a lot i've only been doing it for probably two weeks and I already got two contracts, but still trying uh -huh. to find buyers for it. Um, the main question is, <clears throat> I asked Rick last week too, um, when you're trying to decide if you're going to rent it, like for a buyer, rent it or flip it, like when you want, when you want to like advertise it that way, um, how do you guys go about doing that? I bring it to flipper buyers and I bring it to rental buyers and see which one's going to pay more. <clears throat> I didn't know if there was a different market for each one. Uh, there are different markets, right? So if a property is cheaper and it can rent out, it doesn't need that much work. They're really good for rentals. If it needs some work, but it's in a really good market, that's really hot for rentals. I still go after it. And if it's a market where the rentals are decent, but you can make more money flipping it, that's probably where you bring it. You got to bring it to the right person. Right. And that's honestly what I can tell you. So finding them is easy, right? A lot of the rental people are in their little category, right? So they're doing the four rents. That's how you find them. And the flippers, cash sales, flipper tab, prop stream. Um, I just bring them to both because they both want to make money and they both could probably make money either way. So you just got to let them decide, not you. Because okay. you're ultimately still on the contract. Also the inspection. Um, I, so I recently um, partnered up and JV'd one of my contracts because I can't find a buyer and he has a big buyer's list. And he said, technically, you don't need an inspection period um, and just go by the closing date. Is that how you guys operate or what's the best way to go about doing that? No, I would not do that at all. That's not how. <clears throat> so you, you, um, it's just, this is bad advice. So write it off as that. You need to have an inspection period because if well, you, if you don't. Well, Jared, let me ask you a quick question. Has that per just ask that person for the last five deals they've done uh, for HUDs. And if they can't provide that for you, just be, start being a little wary. I think he got okay. it from his contractor, right? Yeah. Well, he he's a, he's a buyer, and if he can't buy in the area that he wants, if it's out like the area he buys in, mm -hmm. he he's a wholesaler. 
Just be careful. I, I, there's a lot of people puffing their chest saying they're the best cash buyers. Listen, they don't do any deals. And so if, if there's someone you actually know, not a Facebook person, I guess you don't have to do that. But you need, you're going to need an inspection period because sure. you just need, you have to legally be able to get out of it. Yeah. So and have an excuse legally to get out of the property. Theoretically, you can technically not. But like, again, if you get sued, which you won't, but like, if the seller sues you because you didn't perform, I have clearly stated an inspection period to get out within 30 days. And you clearly give the seller, hey, hey, in 30 days, I can get out of it. It's just the right thing to do, too. So it's a win so for in, everyone. In his contract, he said that he doesn't do the inspection period, but he makes it clear that he's going to sign the contract. And if he can't find a buyer for that contract, that we can get out of it. That's mm -hmm. fine. That's a lot harder to get a contract sold. Yeah, and then, <laughs> it's a lot harder to get someone to sign that versus the uh, first one. The inspection periods, it just, listen, you, you got to try to figure out like what they're saying is true and not everyone tells you the truth. <laughs> Doing the latter part is 10 times the amount of work. Oh yeah. And he, I get it. He thinks by skipping the inspection, it's going to induce him to sign the contract quicker by, by putting that terminology in the end, I think would scare a seller off even more. So always have an inspection period. It's just in case something goes bad, you can't get a buyer. The property's much worse than you thought. It happens all the time. You want to have the legal ramifications to get out because in case you were to get sued, go, listen, I had a 21-day inspection period. I got out on the 10th date. Here's the email. Here's the proof. Oh, case dismissed. You do it the other way you have to go to court and fight it all the way out. So I've been in court. I'm here to tell you, you always want an inspection period. It really kind of protects both parties. And I've to say I've never written a contract without an inspection period is not correct. But keep in mind, guys, I've been doing this 20 years. Every now and then I got to reach on something I really want. And I'm usually buying it way below 50 cents on the dollar. And I'm very familiar with the property. End of story. So at the end of the day, you got to protect yourself. What we're trying to do is this technique is about managing and mitigating your risk. Okay. Because if you get sued, even if you're not wrong in the United States, you have to defend yourself. The average lawsuit just to defend is almost $10,000, even if you're hundred percent right. So if you get sued, it will cost you 10 grand to unwind your name on average. Okay. Ask me how I know. And it's ridiculous and it's not fair. So when someone gives you advice, don't do an inspection period. It's just their personal thing. I've entered into probably 10,000 plus contracts. I'm just telling you, protect yourself at all times. And if you, you stick to this rule, you minimize your risk. Unless you like risk, then get rid of it because eventually someone will misinterpret what you say. And then you have to unwind it in court. The inspection port clearly gives you and out without having the other party's approval and any case would get dismissed as long as you follow and uh, you know, follow procedures on it. I used your guys' contract on it and uh, I did use a 14 day inspection mm -hmm. period and a 30 day mm -hmm. closing date. Um, but when I started to JV with this guy, he, um, he was asking to just do, do, do the closing date, do an extension on the closing date. But I extended the inspection period from seven to 14 and because I had a seven day at first, yeah. Like thirty days. <clears throat> yeah. So if you can get thirty days in today's market, it's just a little more ideal because okay. you can kind of wrap everything up into it. But listen, I keep the inspection period because it mitigates your risk. That that's okay. the main reason you do it. And buyers and sellers are comfortable with the conversation on inspection. They understand it, and they 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 have to honor it. If you start trying to put your special little clauses in the addendum, that's where miscommunication comes. And that's when they hire a lawyer. And remember, even if you're hundred percent right, if you got sued, you have to pay to unwind it. Cause after 20 days in the United States, you're, they're going to enter into a default judgment against you. And then whatever they decide you're going to get. So for that reason, the inspection period, whenever I've had an inspection period, someone's threatened to sue or do it something, it kills it instantly. There's no defense to it. I had a 21 day inspection period. I let them know on day 10. What's the problem? Yeah. The judge is going to say the same thing. Dismissed. 
And uh, how do you guys think the mobile home market is? Is that a good market? Like if I, because I'm in Knoxville, Tennessee, and there's a lot of surrounding areas that's not as populated as Knoxville, but yeah. they got a lot of mobile homes. Like if on it's in Knox property. County, it's going to be good, dude. So okay. you, you, you have, I'm in Knox County. Yeah, there's there's two ways to attack it. Either you can attack the entire mobile home park. It's not that hard of a strategy. It's just it's a long due diligence period. So you have to have at least 90 to 120 days if you buy the whole park. That's the super sexy thing because you can take down 200 units in one shot. And the really cool part is a lot of the financing is created amongst the seller and the buyer. So because banks don't want to go all in on a mobile home park. The second way is the individual mobile home parks. Maybe that you're speaking to that. The only um, rule on that is to make sure they own the land underneath of it. If they're leasing the land, it's a nightmare. Yeah. You don't okay. really have anything other than a car. So if you hear the on a key term land. lot rent run. Yeah. If you hear the word lot rent other than that, why are they so attractive? Because it's the new affordable housing in, in the United States. The uh, taxes are very, very minimal and they don't go through the roof because it's only assessed on the land uh, land value. And number three, mobile homes are like cheap. They can be in and out. So a lot of times in the state of Florida, I can buy a nice trailer home for around 60 to 70 grand, have it dropped on as long as the utilities. And I can rent that sucker right off the bat for 1200 bucks. The math already works instantly just by having somebody have the land. So if you can find a mobile home, like we used to turn them down all the time. So we can buy one now for 10 to 15 grand if we can find them anymore and rent them out for a thousand plus. It's very hard to do that with regular single family homes because the costs are so high. And I like them. They're a low entry point. Yes, there's a little bit more drama collecting the rents, but on paper, it's probably some of the sexiest cash flow you'll ever see. Okay. All right, guys. I appreciate it. Okay, man. Appreciate good it. luck. Go after Jared. Have a good one. Appreciate All right. it. Next here we got Javier. Hey, what's up, guys? What's up? How are you? I'm good. How are you guys? Awesome. How can I help you out become a better wholesaler today? Uh, I wanted to see if we can uh, role play cold calling. Okay. Sure. Just be just because um, I've been cold calling, but I feel like the way I say things, like I don't come out as like confident, and then the sellers don't take me serious. Okay. Give me, let's go. I shoot. Okay. All right. Ring, ring, ring. Hello. Hi, is this the owner of One Two Three Main Street? Yes. Hey, this is Javier. I just had a quick question. Are you interested in selling that property? Possibly. Okay. Can you tell me a little bit more about it? I mean, what do you want to know about it? Um, why would you be interested in selling it? Uh, it's not your business. <clears throat> okay. Uh, okay. See, it frees up. Like, I don't know what to say. Like, I, I wouldn't know what to say then. It's pretty easy. I, I, all right. So you asked me, can you tell me about the property on MCTP? Which one is that? Um, condition. Condition. How do you ask for a condition? Um, you would ask like, what's the condition of the property? And so you asked, you asked that, and I asked, what do you want to know about the condition? And then you froze. Yeah. So condition of a property. So at freelancing.com, we kind of talk about this, right? Condition of the property is based off of not too many things, right? So it's based off of number one, the roof. The AC, the heating system, the flooring, the updating, how old is the property, things like that. You, you, you straight from asking about condition to motivation. And that was kind of weird. So, like, okay. so uh, you got to stick to MCTP, bro. Like, I mean, so you went on condition. You didn't get condition, so you went to motivation, which was I, stick to mo condition if you're on condition. Okay. Right? Let me ask right. you a question over here. How many cold calls have you done? Contacts, like hellos. Like hellos, like um Legit. like 45, maybe. 45. Yeah. After 45, you're still 
So you're going to have to up those numbers because if you've talked to 45 people and you still don't know condition, we, we got to work on that. Okay. So, I mean, are you ner- like, are you just nervous to talk to us? Like conditions, I mean, what is it? It's roof, AC, repairs. How old yeah. is the property, right? You just got to right. ask that. Okay. You, you got you to, gotta, the, the whole goal of if you can get to a cold call and get past the them not hanging up on you and like just flat out disqualifying them is you got to turn your script into some sort of conversation. Remember the birds on you, not them. You called them. So like right. Right off the bat, when you start doing like yes, no questions, it can blow up on you. So you got to find a okay. way to ask a question to have them expand. So if God gave you two ears and one mouth at the beginning of the call, you have to talk predominantly more to get them going. And number one, you just got to be a human being. So when reading off a script and they, you know, you can say, Hey, uh, can you tell me about the condition of the house? Say, Hey Rick, can you tell me a little bit more about the house? Like, is this like a house someone would like want to live in or you just, you got to get them talking. They all want to flow at the mouth about the house. You just got to warm them up to it. And then when they start like, yes, knowing you, you're going to have to shock them into it and go, listen, I'm just trying to find out a little bit more about the house to, to see if we can strike something together. What, when's the last time you did a big renovation on the house? And then just try to spark something. Um, <clears throat> like a lot of times I'll go when it's not going well, like why, why do you live in Phoenix? Is like, is that like, do you have family there? And remember sometimes if they won't talk to you about the house, get them to start talking about their family, their occupation, their recreations, their dreams. You've heard all this before. You got to get some sort of conversation to go. Cause if you just keep getting that yes, no spin, it ain't going to go very far. And maybe they're just a hard no. And they just, they're messing with you. Like, I mean, Javier, you were, you were ready to go for the, for the role play, but like you weren't prepared at all, you know? <clears throat> and so one thing I could tell you is why don't you just make a cheat sheet? Right? Like, so yeah. obviously you were doing the telltale side of not knowing what you're saying or not lying, but like not knowing what to do, which is just looking up while you're speaking. If you yeah. look at like a re- replay, you do that. When I talk, when I look at a seller and they're just being like, well, uh, I know for a fact they're lying or they don't know what to say or they're uncomfortable. So you should mm-hmm. not be doing that. You should be looking down mm-hmm. at the paper you have. And you, this mm-hmm. would be pretty simple, but like you got MCTP, motivation. Why are you looking to sell the property? Condition. Can you tell me about the property? Roof, AC. How long have you lived in the property? Things like that. You should be, it should be a lot easier to do it. Okay. I mean, I don't think you have the experience to start winging the, the script. And if you can't right. get them talking, you have no shot at getting a deal. Yeah. So at that point, when they're they're doing yes, no, and you're like, does you have an AC? And you're like, yes. Is the air does the heater work? Yes. You you're gonna have to shock them into a conversation. Yeah. Hey, how did you wind up in Phoenix, by the way? Just get it, get something where they'll spit a paragraph out to you. And once they get talking. You can pat. The reality is you're a stranger. You've called them. You've caught them off guard and they're on high alert. And until you get them past that stranger phase, you're not going to get far. The key to getting them past that is getting them talking. How do you get them talking? Get them talking about the house or talking about the self. Have you ever met anybody that doesn't like to talk about themselves or their family? No, everybody likes to talk about themselves. Hey, Hey, you got kids? Shut up, man. They'll just ooze it out. My daughter's doing this. My son does this. And once they start doing it, they talk about something they like. Then suddenly you're not a stranger anymore. But you just got to get past through that stranger phase. And so on your cheat sheet, you have your MCTP, but just have like little guidelines. Are they talking? Yeah. Are they talking more than I am? And if not, like jolt into it. Every now and then when I can't get anywhere, I don't do a lot of cold calling, but I do have to make some very cold calls. Sometimes when it's not going right, I'm like, have I upset you? And just kind of like, I probably, what's, the, what's the worst that's going to happen to you? I probably wouldn't say that on a cold call. No. But like, I mean. You have. Huh? A lot of times you do upset them, but. No, you upset them, but you don't really ask that unless it's going bad. I mean, sometimes <laughs> you're upset with the questions you're asking or if you're not saying it in a confident manner. You now, if you're confident they're like that, Sure. But dude, you just got to make a cheat sheet because your lack of confidence is coming from not knowing what to say after someone says yes. Yeah. And if you have it written out, it should get a lot simpler, man. 
And the, okay. the only way you get the repetition and the confidence is you got to keep doing it over. Yeah, and you're over at 45. Again. You should be. You got to bump those numbers up, and you should make a cheat sheet. You're you're free, you're you're winging it, and that's not a good thing to do. You just got to get them talking. Okay. You got it. You got to get a conversation. So remember, it, it, it's kind of like the court says, and the burden's on you to engage them, not the other way around. So you have to. You have to be kind of like the, you know, the DJ, like what's the purpose of a DJ other than playing music at like a wedding? Mm. What, what's their ultimate goal? To like get everybody like. In get a, them engaged, have little, fun, little, make it a memorable little. experience. But when you go to a wedding, guess what? Nobody wants to go on that dance floor right off the bat. You, you don't want like Slick Rick going out there doing man's moves right off the bat because it's probably going to clear the room. So what they do yeah. is they ease you into an easy song. You're like, mom and dad, come on out. And why do you think they do like the father-daughter dance first? Like they get somebody out there dancing first and they join them in. It's the Next, first dance first. It is. And then all of a sudden everyone starts joining in. You got to do the same way. You got to kind of warm them up and get it in there. Inject your personality. If your family had to tell me one thing, like they're going to go, hey, Javier is the best at this. What are they going to say? Like right off the bat. Hey, I'm, what, I'm what, what are you honest. known for? What are you known for in your family? I'm known, what am I known for? God, God gave everybody a special skill set. If you like it or not, you got it. So if I had to ask, especially like young kids associated with their family, they go, tell us about Javier. Sum them up in like two or three words. What are they going to say? Hey, I don't know. Um, are you the funny guy in the family? Are you the confident one? Are you the one that like talks everyone's head up? Are you, are you smart the smart one? Or, what, what, it... Yeah, I, I, I'd say I'm like the, like if you're kind of stuck on something, you're coming to me and like we'll figure it out. So I guess oh, that's so you, I guess. you know how to solve problems. So help yeah. sellers solve problems. Like find out what you're really good at it and just accent that so many times you guys go and try to accent something that you don't like to do and you're not good at if you're not good at like jokes and being funny don't do it unfortunately it comes a little bit naturally to me and it gets me in trouble sometimes because like i do it sometimes at the wrong time with like your wife or your daughter you guys know what i'm talking about and i use it to cut the tension from a situation he does it too and sometimes it's a gift sometimes it's a curse I just like to have fun. Like that's my main thing. I'm always like a funny guy. Rick always wants to engage people and be like kind of the life of the party. I know how to connect with people. So you know how to problem solve, but get in there and start helping people solve problems and just be systematic with it. So come up with the notes that make you com yeah. comfortable in your flow. Ask, put the yeah. questions for each one and then put all the objections there at freelisting.com and then go from there, dude. Come back next okay. week after calling a hundred people yeses okay. not yeses but um mm. contacts and have it all written okay. out we can go from there and a lot of times just by asking a question a different way you can invoke an emotion in a conversation so when you're theoretically asking what someone's the, the condition of the property is hey how nice of an area is that property in what's the quality of the roof you have some people go in like it. major detail on it and just find a way to ask the question three or four different times Sometimes when they don't answer the question, just by re-asking a different way, they'll, they'll give you the answer you've been looking for. I mean, Javier, I mean, how many times do you have to keep, <clears throat> how many times do you have to keep, uh, you know, putting your hand on the hot stove before you stop? For, where you get something? Once. Once? All right. Well, make yeah, this one point. Like okay. You know what to do. Write it, write it, yeah, write, write it, write it down, bro. All right. All right. Get after it, man. All right, thank you guys. I appreciate it. Week. I'll see you next week. How many? Right, see you next week. How many do you need to do? A uh, hundred contacts. All right, make a cheat sheet. Let's All get right. it. All appreciate right, thank it. you guys. Appreciate it. That's it, guys. If you're going out here without a plan, it can do well. And for a lot of people, they you need cheat sheet. It's not bad, right? No, oh. it's like you know, uh, you need cheat sheet for like conversions when you're cooking and stuff. Like some expert cooks can do it in their head. <sighs> Maybe if you're not an expert yet, just have it there. Because if you're mixing up the wrong ingredients, it ain't going to do well, right? Yeah. Have the conversions there. If you're in school, you don't need a cheat sheet. There you do. A lot. You still in math, you do, yeah. If I you're doing to, geometry. I used, and I used to have one on the inside of my hand. 
That's why I never got through the class. <laughs> John, what is up? <clears throat> hey guys, how you doing? doing first good. time. How are you? First time. Yeah. So um you look little bit about yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm up I'm up in New Jersey, but I'm only doing virtual at this time. Um, okay. I started way back in August. Uh, there was another person similar to you that's no longer with us. Um, and I took a break um, at the end of August. And, um, you know, I, I came across your material. Uh, great stuff. Great information. Love you both. Um, so I'm starting to get back into the same market that I was in, which is Toledo. Um, I'm having struggles with Toledo virtually. Um, seems to be very uh, um, saturated at this point virtually. Um, and considering switching to another market, um, I haven't done anything on the boots on the ground in New mm -hmm. Jersey yet, um, but a plan to in the future. What do you guys think um, I should concentrate on? If you have to, what's your marketing? Um, just uh, doing right now um, text messaging um, in Toledo. Um, I have some buyers there, some large buyers, some small buyers. Um, it seems that uh, a lot of people selling in the area are large owners to small owners getting out of the market because the prices have gone up so much. Ron, yes. you give me the rod. What, what's the bait? What's on the bait? You tell me you're texting. What are you, what, what are you texting with? What list? Um, I'm, using, um, I'm using launch control. So I'm doing 600 messages a day. Um, the, the bait that I'm using, um, so I've done everything from high equity to vacant owners. Um, I blew through the same list that I did in, in August again, just because I had the leads. So I went through the whole mm -hmm. thing again, started to cycle in some newer information and just wondering, you know, what, what tends to work the best in that area? What, what do you think? So did you watch the beginning of this video? Yes. And what, what's the title of the video on Flip the <laughs> I know, I know. You're getting back, circling back. Okay. We're circling back. I made this video for you. Yes, All right? exactly. <laughs> so you are blaming the market, not the marketing. Add ING to it, okay? You need to start I blaming agree. the marketing. I All right. Agree. So your first thing you told me was saturated, right? Yes. Because you won't find it saturated because you are fishing in the same pond as everybody else. And there's mm -hmm. plenty of ponds out here. Nobody's fishing. And you think it's the fish in the lake or the fishermen around you that's the problem. No, you just got to go to a different lake. And they're okay. still in the same area, all right? Yep. So if 80% of wholesalers get their first deal from drying for dollars, which you're virtual, can't yes. do that, right? Yes. You got government lists, right? Yes. Like, because if every other wholesaler in Toledo, especially virtual people, are doing the paid list because it's easy, because mm -hmm. you did the easy list pulling, now you're dealing with pain in the back end. Let's mm -hmm. do some pain in the front and make it easier on the back end. So do you think do you think I should just put a pause on the virtual and just go to boots on the ground here in, in North Jersey then? No, keep Toledo. Keep Toledo. Okay. Keep Toledo. We just saw Benji. He made 50 grand on a probate. Okay. Have you been pulling the probates? Um, the probates are very small um, from the list that I could do. I mean, I don't know how to get them without being in Toledo specifically. Um, you know, you from ask. the virtual. Ask. Okay. Ask, call them right. up and ask. Okay. Right? Okay. So the answer I, is no, you didn't do probates. Let's have the probates, <laughs> right? Okay. What's Toledo's county? Um, that's Lucas County. All right. Let's look at Lucas County probates real quick. Lucas County probates. Ohio probates are actually not that difficult. Mm -hmm. um, Lucas County probate court. Boom. That's money right there. All right, so let me show you. You see my screen? Actually, is this the right one? Let me check. Is this Ohio? Yeah, Lucas County, Ohio, probate court. Mm -hmm. So call the court with your questions right here. Boom. Okay. Uh, click to historic case information. And they got all the historical data here. Great. Awesome. I it's live in front of everybody. TR. <laughs> Thank you, oh, by the way. I don't really follow <laughs> that much. I'm going to fail it. Oh, boom. I don't know if they're going to give you the whole docket, though. You got to forget. Look, the name. They're like, oh, first name, last name. Uh. Guess what? We go up here to case type. But your favorite guru don't tell you about this. All right, let's do 
2022. Let's go by where's probate's going to be on here. What's probate? Uh, estate, right? Which one would this be on, you think? I'm guessing it's estate, right? Yeah, they're not giving you much. That's fine. We'll just search it up. <clears throat> oh, decedent, party, probate, Ohio. What's up? Let's go. Awesome. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, the other, the other question I have, um, I've had some deals that were in August. Um, obviously, um, there's some issues, uh, you know, when, um, when you get to the, um, getting to, to have someone to buy them from you. Um, and I've since learned a lot by watching what you guys have done, talking and vetting the, uh, cash buyers, like Rick had said, awesome stuff. And now I have a large group of people, but the people that seem to be consistently buying in, in that area are large people. Some of them hedge funds, some of them 200 plus and getting information out of them seems to be a little bit more difficult, but they will buy, you know, um, any advice on how to deal with larger corporations or anything like that when you're, you know? Yeah. I, I'm not big on the hedge fund, hedge fund buyers right now. I mm -hmm. mean, I'd still keep it small time. Right. So co calling the four rents. Facebook groups, and you can even go after the flippers on like PropStream or ZachData.com, right? You just mm -hmm. find people flipping properties. Okay. And those aren't corporations. Okay. And hey, you look for some houses, go there. Eat. And then on top of that, if you really want to get the big money buyers, realtors all day. Cash sales on cheap real estate mm -hmm. in Toledo. Right. Realtor.com, ZachData.com, buyer represented all day, every day. Okay. Yeah. Cause I, I haven't done it to that yet, but I know about that. And that's one of the things I'm going to be doing this afternoon when you guys are done. Dude, so. There's a million ways to make money in Toledo virtually. Okay. And I can help okay. you out with it. Okay, great. Awesome. We that's all I got the areas now. in Toledo, bro. We um, about that yet. Well, I'm in uh, the areas that are good. Uh, four, three, six, one, two, six, one, three, which are, ah, la, 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 I don't care. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> don't tell me yeah, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. But the, basically the, the, the North and West of Toledo, um, yeah. generally the higher ARV areas where you're, you know, you're approaching a hundred to 150,000, something like that. Oh, wow, that's crazy. Um, yeah. Downtown yeah. it's, it's a mess when it, you know, especially when it's $70,000 to repair a house and yeah. the comps are only in the fifties, you know, so it doesn't work. So, but yeah, thank you very much guys. I appreciate it. I'll be back again and let you know how things work out. Awesome. Thank you. Awesome. Same and way. let me ask you one last question. If sure. you can study in Facebook really hard, go yes. to like the Toledo Facebook groups on them uh, and yeah, try to find the top wholesalers in that market and try to see if any of them are selling courses or stuff and just see, don't buy their course, but Obviously. see what marketing they say. A lot, a lot of these people like to go on podcasts and they get like 30 views on them. Mm -hmm. And it's this big shot Toledo guy. They'll tell you what they're doing for the marketing and just, swoop in oh okay the tired landlords working here okay go do it okay. right yep. stuff you gotta do all right thanks man thanks guys all okay. right have a great one See you, all man. right thanks one quick tip i can give to you here is first of all we just showed you how to get the probates in lucas county so shout out to john there we helped him out but like a lot of you guys are saying this in your head and i want you guys to understand this a lot of you guys are saying to yourself right now the probate list just seems too difficult. I can't do it. It has to be, I, I can't do it virtually. I'm stinking behind a computer right now in Florida. And in under five minutes, I found the probates right there. Decedent probate address, all the information right there. Was it because I had some special like login? No, I literally searched Lucas County probate court, Ohio. First pop, boom, boom, boom. Go in there, guys. Don't make that excuse to yourself unless you've actually tried it. It's right there. It's all there for you. It's it just, you got to try it. It's shockingly easy to pull the probates and it seems difficult, but for a lot of counties, mm -mm. I don't even know if Toledo is easy. I just, he just said it. I'm like, boop, 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 boom. And sometimes you get counties where it's actually really difficult to do, <clears throat> but some counties are a lot easier. Natalie. Hey, how you doing? Good. How are you? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Thank you for asking. So I had a quick question. Well, I have a couple questions. 
Um, I have a mobile home and I know that someone was just on here and they were talking about mobile homes. I have a mobile home now under contract, but I struggle to find the ARV and I struggle to find any numbers with the mobile home. And um, the when I went to go look at the property, the property uh, was in good condition. The owner had did um, some upgrades, but he just moved into a house. He didn't want the mobile home anymore. So I just was, um, I was a little nervous with, he wanted 58 for it. And um, so I'm a little nervous with, uh, with how to market it. And if I don't know a, a ARV or if I don't know um, much of the numbers, like how to market it so much, I, I'm a little nervous. Well, Natalie, um, yes. is the land owned underneath the property? That was the next question I had. No, he's renting the land. They don't know. If you go to fearlessing.com, we clearly say in the mobile home wholesaling module, they don't own the land, don't wholesale the deal. It's not worth the 50 You're wholesaling grand. vehicles at this point, and you can't actually wholesale a vehicle because the title company can't give you a check because it's not real estate. Uh, okay. It's a DMV issue, not a real yeah, estate there, issue. There's a reason he's moving out of there. They just keep raising the rents, and you're, you're never going to have control. Yeah. And usually when it's, a, it's called a lot lease, there's usually one majority owner and they've written the rules so against you that nine times out of 10, it's hard to even flip the property. Like they have deed restrictions you want, and you won't find this out until you go to sell it. And listen, they got to own the land. That's the one rule. It's the only way it works because that is deemed real estate. If they don't own the land, you're flipping a car. That's it. And honestly, at 58 grand, you can buy a brand new trailer for it. Got it. Why okay. would you buy that one? You could just pull up a new one for sixty to seventy thousand. Brand spanking new, never lived in before. Which would you rather have? Right, right. That's it. Okay. And then the idea is, you know, how much would that thing rent out for? Do you think? Um, that uh, I, I think I want to. I want to say what I would say between the twelve and fifteen. Yeah. Well. I is don't it, wholesale that deal. I'm yeah, just telling yeah, you. Really, don't, don't like, do it. I, you're, you're, the cash you're buyers to aren't figured out. They're not going to want it. You it, don't own the real estate. Don't do it. You, you don't control it either. So no cash buyer wants that either. And then most, oh, so most many them, is, so it's when the land. So when the land is rented, but you own the mobile home, you don't want to wholesale it. Wait, say that again. So he he owns the mobile home, but he rents the land. Yes, Natalie, we wholesale real estate. Mobile homes are not real estate. The land underneath it is real estate. Oh, okay. Right? okay. Got it. Got so, it. Yeah. You're technically, that is a vehicle from the DMV. Mm. And we're not in the car flipping business. Go to Fast and Loud and <laughs> ask them, you know. Uh, but like, you know, we, we deal with real estate. And real estate is when there's land involved. And okay. as far as don't want it, title companies can't pay you. Not a good deal. Okay. Okay. So, okay. That's cool. That answered that. Okay. And then I have another question. Um, I'm in San Antonio and I'm in my, in my own market here in San Antonio um, for pre foreclosure. It took me a long time like to find the list on, um, on the internet. I was able to find the pre foreclosures and I wanted to get into pre foreclosures. But um, my question was, um, I have two questions on that. Is it true that in um, a homeowner could come back for their property in five years? What state? Texas. I don't believe so. <clears throat> it would be a big app. There would be such a huge mass of people who lost their house in a pre-foreclosure five years ago that wants it back because it's worth 5X value. Uh, I don't believe that's a thing, right? Yeah, because you'd have lawyers chasing out. It's called, a, you're, you're talking redemption about the right period. of a redemption period. So yeah, stop getting like everyone's interpretation okay. and go read the rules for it. Yeah, like, read the rules. It's all online. And then if, you're struggling with that, go to your local title company and yeah. say, how does right of redemption work in the state of I'm Texas? I'm 99% sure. Right of redemptions are usually a year max. If you can get a pre for, I would do a pre foreclosure mm -hmm. on all the homes I own in Texas if that was the case, because I would stop paying, I'd lose the house, wait for five years of equity to build up and then pay it for the price I had it at the pre foreclosure five mm -hmm. years ago. That's that's not yeah. a thing. So um, so most of them, most of them, like, I'm usually not a lawyer. Tax sales though. Is usually within like 10 days after the auction. It's like a very small window or a year at most or two years. But like <clears throat> sometimes they're like a year, but there's penalties and all sorts of things with it. So look it up online and then talk mm -hmm. to your title company and you should get a clear answer on that. 
Okay. And then on, on that, um, I was going to ask ideally how far an auction date should I like when, when, because I, when I looked it up, it gave me everyone's auction date. This was, I want to, I looked it up like a week ago and everyone's auction date that I was looking at were coming up like January 3rd, January 5th. Is that a, a good time frame? Like being in December and their auction date is January 3rd. Well, the, the, the rule of thumb with any type of foreclosure, pre foreclosure, the sooner you can catch them before the auction, the more options and availability you have to you to help them out with it. When okay. you get within 30 days of the auction, it gets challenging. So what okay. happens is before the auction, procrastination is running rampant. Like they're not going to make a decision. Nothing's happening. I'm past the red warnings. Then when they get a final notice and the sheriff slaps something on the door, says, you know, it's going to auction, public auction, complete nuclear meltdown happens. And then they call you and go, I'm ready to do a deal now. Well, remember when I told you four months ago, the sooner we do this, the more options I have for you. Because when it comes to that, a lot of times it takes a um, court um, motion to stop the auction. Yeah, it says here at Texas A&M that it's only good for, this is what Texas A&M's um, real estate publication says. They said for Texas, it is, hold on, let me pop it up on the screen for you to read here. Just to show you, I don't talk out of my butt. Mm -hmm. um, it says right here, the redemption is the purchase plus penalties interest arises. It gives the incentive to bidders to purchase. Oh, it has to, I think they can redeem it at only at fair market value, which drives it crazy. But it says this applies only to delinquent tax sales. So I don't believe for pre-foreclosures, but I could be wrong too. That's just mm. what I'm saying. And I just find out from your title company, they probably helped Who you Who told out. you that? Um, it was um, a, a buyer who actually said uh, I was, uh, talking to a buyer and um, we were, we were having conversation and I know her prior to me even getting into wholesaling. She actually was in wholesaling. And when me and her were talking, she, she uh, said that she stays far away from the pre foreclosures because of that. Well, I would talk, talk to the title company and ask, yeah. cause if they ever deem it at fair market value, then I would still buy those things. Who cares? Yeah, like, who cares? And honestly, you don't even own it that long to begin with anyway, so it's not really like your issue. So the main thing you got to understand, anyone who's in a distressed situation, they do have rights to get out of contracts and stuff. Like in the state of Florida, if someone's in foreclosure, pre-foreclosure, mm -hmm. they sign a contract with me, I legally have to let them know that they have three days to get out of the contract. And stuff like that, you just got to kind of give disclosures. But honestly... The way the rules I just read from Texas, like you're fine. Like no one's gonna come back and buy it at fair market value. Like it doesn't even make sense. Still talk to the title company. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And then um, the other question I had um, with the coal violations, I finally was able to get coal violations for Bear County, which is over here in, in San Antonio, covers the wide range. Uh, but it's a lot of violations that I don't understand. I know you said before you're going for like high Ask. grad. Huh? Ask what <laughs> every violation means. They, they give you, a, they give a code on them or no, you have to call and ask for the code. Yeah. So the, they either give you a, like a number or well, like they, a, t like a, like a letter symbols for it. They give, uh, it has, uh, um, names on there. <clears throat> And it's like a whole bunch of different names. The the question I wanted to ask you both were if it says vacant, overgrown property weeds, um, that's what it is, right? The high grass. Mm -hmm. I want to yeah. go for those ones right there. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I just wanted to make sure. And then, um, so I had a, my first deal. I just did my first deal last month. And it was, um, it was actually just, it just fell in my lap because somebody knew what I was doing and knew how I was doing it. And um, so she came to me and asked me if I could help her. So we got it under contract. I did everything right. When we got to the point where title title company sent her and I, I mean, her and, and, and buyer, the master, of, I forget the name of it. It was like some agreement to show seller what's, you know, the whole layout and the, to show buyer she calls me and she like 
flip because she didn't feel like I should make what I was supposed to make and cause me to argue with me at title. In that situation, how would you go about that? Like realsing.com and ask the questions to your buyers the next time that the right ones to ask. A very important question we ask all of our buyers before we even give them a contract, an assignment contract is, first of all, are you okay if I made 100K on this deal? Yes, I am. Perfect. Okay. And then send the assignment contract and you make 40 and they won't be upset. Did you ask well, that buyer that question? It wasn't the buyer. It was the seller. Oh, the seller? The seller. The seller felt I should have made. How much were you making? Huh? How much did you make? It was, it, well, it was supposed to be, it was supposed to be 16. 16,000. Yeah. It was supposed to be 16,000. She made a huge argument about it. And because it was my first go around and I was nervous, I didn't want the deal to slip. Oh, the seller? Yeah. Oh, this is easy. So first of all, Mr. Seller, did you sign an agreement to buy the property for 90,000? Yes. Are you upset that you're getting 90,000? Are you upset that you're getting the amount of money you agreed to? I'm giving this to my partner. The way that we're doing the profit split on this is I'm getting the profit up front. And then when they sell it and they flip it, they're getting the profit too. Because I don't want to wait until they flip it in three to four months. They're giving me my, some money for the proceeds up front. Is that a problem? You're getting what you agreed to. We're flipping the property. <clears throat> You've known this. We're going to make money off of the property. I'm getting some of my proceeds up front because I don't want to put in a lot of money in the renovations. That's it, Mr. Seller. And, and then just letting... How can they be upset over that, and right? Then, and then letting the seller know, say, listen, um, just to let you know, I do this to make a profit. Um, depends on how much work the house needs, how much money I got to bring to the table. There's a lot of factors that come into play. If you set that conversation up very front when you meet with everybody, you've planted that seed. So if they come back and, and have like a meltdown on you, so remember, I told you, you know, I do this to make a profit and to help you out. But if, yeah, like that's it. But yeah. like you, the last thing you ever want to do, and I, and I feel for you, is get into a him haw with the seller because it, think about it. They're, they're up, they were okay with the price you're getting them. Now they see what like you're making on it and then they're upset. It's kind of like, you know, why can't I be getting that? Because you wanted a no hassle deal to get it done. So always preempt them, say, listen, do it, make a profit. I have no idea if I'm even going to make a profit, but this is what I do. Once you disclose it, you can kind of push it back to them and go, listen, this deal was tight even to begin with. And Zach's saying, listen, I'm getting prepaid because they're going to do the rehab. It is the truth. But what you have to do is work out an agreement with your title company because you're nine times out of 10, your title company made it a much bigger deal than it needed to be. Because did you know that most sellers have no idea even to find out what your profit amount is on the HUD unless someone points them to it. So Ooh. I would review the process with your title company to make sure they're not running you under the bus as well. Uh, okay. Remember, who brought the business to the title company? I did. Yeah. So they need to kind of like do a better job. I'm willing to bet your title company made it a bigger deal than it needed to be. And that's why you're having this problem. Yeah. You, you, or do a lot of wholesalers use that title company? Yeah. So, so, so talk to them and go, yeah. listen, um, my seller like freaked out about this. So I've, I've literally sat in a title company, like the ones I don't do business with. And they go, Hey, well, we're guessing what the title yeah, company yeah. said. So we don't know. So sometimes they go out of the way. They go, Hey, Natalie's making 16,000 off of you. It's like terrible <laughs> word. Maybe it it's wasn't, like, may, maybe it was on the HUD. We don't know. Yeah. So, so we're, 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 now we're just guessing. Talk so, to your title company yeah. and do a preemptive strike with your sellers. Well, why did the seller get upset? Was it on the HUD or did the title company say it? Is she seen it on the HUD? And so she's she, on the HUD. So we can't blame the title she, company. Yeah. We're not doing a blind HUD. So she was, she was already, it started, it started kind of going. She knew that I was going, the thing was, she knew I was going to wholesale it. She like yeah. knew I wholesaled. It's even worse. So, so how much did you have to take off of it to make her happy? And to make her happy, I had to pay the property taxes. So it was like 4,000 off of it. Uh, that's a little bit more. I, 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 you could have double closed it and I would gave up two it. grand. Oh yeah. See, and, and, I, I probably, that's what I probably and I'm, do. I'm not a big fan of double closing because it's going to cost more money, but sometimes you have to do it. Go, 
Okay, I'm not going to give four grand. That's insane. But I'll mm -hmm. give two grand back the closing costs to kind of figure it out. Like, this is what happens. This is wholesaling that, like, none of the gurus will tell you about. This stuff happens. So always preempt by saying, hey, I'm going to make a profit. And then number two, just go in and make sure. I would have played hardball. Firm. If you told her you're going to wholesale it and she's upset they made 16, I would have played hardball. I would have probably just because she's trying to get something out of it. I and that's how I felt, but it was causing confrontation just in my house. It was, it was a mess. And I was like, you know what? Just, I would have double closed it, but that's fine. You know, in yeah. the future now when it comes yeah. up. So. Yeah, I was, I was happy for the experience and I was, I was just being grateful that I got to see it all the way through. I got to go from A to Z. I got to do it, you know, like, okay, I actually built relationships doing it. So I just was like, you know what, forget it. Just hey, whatever to make her happy. Grand. So you know what? You saved the deal yourself. There's nothing bad about that. No. So good for you. Thank you. Thank you. And then my last question. Oh, no, two more. Okay. So I use REI and I know um, REI has like a lot of different rules when it comes to SMS blasting. REI. And, huh? REI.com? No, REI reply the okay. software. So I use the SMS blasting on there. And I wanted to ask you, I, I'm getting a lot of, um, I know that initially you'll get a lot of no's. I'm getting a lot of no's, but I wanted to just get your input on what would you think that the, that a good first rate. issue? Huh? What's your delivery rate? Um, well, that I kind of went through. I had to contact uh, REI with, with, get on a couple of Zooms with them because my, Delivery rate was really, really bad. But now That's I fixed the delivery. delivery. Rate. Now it's like um, 80, it's in the 80s and 90s. Okay, good. So I got that problem fixed. And so now I'm, I'm getting more responses and a lot of my responses are all no's. And I just wanted to see if um, you thought or your input on what uh, the initial first message would be. Like my initial, my initial first message is- .com. And okay. go through the SMS modules to see what okay. it should be. It's the double whammy approach. You hit them with a question and then you get them respond and then you hit them the second time. Okay. All right, cool. And then um, I think that was it. Oh, when it comes to code violations, when I and I was able to get it off the Bear County uh, for San Antonio, it, and I'm struggling to get it with um, Dallas. I'm trying to go into Dallas and I'm struggling to get it with Dallas. When it comes to coal violation, I know like water shut off. We, uh, I know you talk about calling and and trying to get it uh, via phone. When it comes to coal violations for Dallas, sh should I call because I, I can't I can't Whoa. find. So I just call the cold um, enforcement department. In, oh. Okay. Yeah. All right. Be very nice Thank to them, and they, they should give it to you. Okay. All right. Well, I think that was everything. Thank you all so much. And um, right. Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. You too. You Congrats too. on that deal. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Have a great one. You too. One. Boom. 8,000. That's uh, not bad still. So guys, that's how you get your first deal. 80% of the time, it's going to be through those methods. And if you're struggling right now, do those methods. So guys, this is Zach Kin signing out. Rick Kin signing out. I will be here tomorrow live. And then I'll also be Thursday and I'll also be Friday. Uh, Rick's hopping off for a fishing trip, uh, with some family and I'm staying here for the lives, but, uh, yeah, so it'd be a pretty fun week, but that's why Rick's on here early today. So yeah, no, we'll figure it out. Well, fun. So we're going to keep everyone updated <laughs> on it. So guys, I appreciate it. I'll hop on one o'clock tomorrow. See you. But most of your questions, again, if you have questions like the SMS script, I don't have 45 minutes to break down my double whammy SMS script, but if you're listening.com, I have the full breakdown, how to answer with that script, all of it. So go there. It's all there. So freelancing.com. Make sure you guys.